and perfect. Uh, uh, first item of business is approval of the minutes. Does anyone have any comments, Mark? Uh, hi. Uh, good evening, all. Um, yes, I am going to comment on the minutes tonight. Uh, so I'm going to begin uh, by saying I will be voting against approving the minutes, uh, even with Laura's additions. And so when I received the minutes last week, um, I, I reviewed them and I, I continue to be uh, moderately frustrated with the extreme brevity of, of our minutes. Uh, and that particular meeting, April 25th, was a pretty big meeting, a big, big concept review. But I thought, you know, I, I, the choice is, am I going to study up on to be prepared for the new meeting? Or am I going to go back and watch the video and try to make edits to the minute? So I said, ah, I'm going to let it go, and I'm going to study up on the new meeting. And uh, thought, well, some other day I'll deal with this. But as I delved into tonight's packet, um, there are a number of places that the tonight's packet refers to both the uh, planning oh board concept re planning board concept review in twenty one uh, and those minutes, and I reviewed those minutes and the tab meeting in twenty twenty two. Um, about the connections, uh, and I reviewed those minutes. And both of those minutes were, uh, both of those sets of minutes from uh, our board in a prior time and the tab board were substantive, they were accurate, and they conveyed the um, essence of what was um, uh, put forth by those boards at the time. And although our meeting was, uh, uh, you know, five or six hours uh, on that April 25th meeting, um, you know, our, our minutes were much shorter than the minutes from those other meetings uh, that were shorter. And I, I don't equate length with accuracy and, and, and value, but I do, it is one measure of, of how uh, what minutes are are uh, supposed to be about, and so and I and I've mentioned this before. Minutes are fall on a spectrum of a transcript where every word is recorded, and some sort of perfunctory document that doesn't really convey the essence. And I find that our minutes have drifted to the perfunctory and not conveying the essence. And and minutes are a useful tool for council, for other boards and commissions to understand our input and our decisions. So um, I'm not requesting that this be an issue that we be addressed tonight. I will request uh, to our Madam Chair that you work with staff to address this at a later, that we have this as a, as a meeting topic sometime in the future, but, um, I uh, am struggling with, with our minutes, and I would request that that be a topic for future discussion. Hey, Brad. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Brad. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Not to interject the discussion and, and certainly let the vote and such play out, but I do want to acknowledge that. Um, one of the casualties of me taking vacation was not uh, being able to follow up yet with uh, you, Sarah, and the board by extension. Uh, we have had internal conversations about the minutes and, and um, uh, city policy in that regard and resources and, and details that I won't get into, you know, for, for the very reason Mark just mentions. Um, but I do owe uh, you, Sarah, a conversation, and, and I will make sure to follow up here in the next week so that we can have an initial conversation and then a broader one with uh, with the board on that. Great. I'm glad to hear 
glad to do that. Um, and when we have that conversation, maybe Mark would like to join us and share his thoughts. Okay, okay. so um, uh, do we still wanna go ahead and vote on this or Mark, do you feel strongly enough that you would prefer that we set this aside for one more until the next meeting and then go forward from there? Cause I think it was a concept review uh, and a site review. Can we do that, Laurel? Sorry, I should check with you first. You, yes, you can delay it. Um, there'll need to be a motion either to delay it or to approve it um, either way so that we can get it so recorded before, on, on these minutes. Before we make a motion, Mark, do you would you be interested in making a motion to delay? Sure, I'm, I'm uh, happy to make a motion. Wait, to... don't do it yet. Before we do that, let's just see if there's any support among everyone else before you go through the process of making a motion. Would there be a mo would there be a second for that a motion that would delay this a bit longer? Um, I would. Can I ask okay. a question? Sure. Uh, would the delay result in any change? Uh, I, I mean, are we expecting there to be some something happen? I think <laughs> that the, would... only, the only delay would be. And Brett, I'll let you talk in a minute. Is is if people want to more closely examine the minutes and add or change things. So, um, Brad, what what did you want to add? It's just a technical matter that I think uh, the probably preferred motion would be to continue it to the next meeting or two meetings out or to use the language of continuing this agenda item. Thank you. Okay, so there were three people who supported a delay or a continuance, Mark, ML and Laura. Um, Lisa, did you want to say something? Wait, wait, for some reason, Lisa, we can't hear you even though you're not muted. No, we still can't hear you. All right, you'll call back in. Uh, Kurt, what did you want to say? And Laura, Lisa will call back and we'll come back to you when you do. Kurt, go ahead. I'll just say that I would certainly support continuing this item if that's the interest of other people. I, I also felt that the, 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 no, the um, minutes were kind of brief, uh, but I probably don't feel as strongly about this as others do. Okay. Um, I want to get let Laura get back in here. I'm not Laura. I'm so sorry. Lisa, to get, I'm, don't get old is my advice to everyone. Um, wait it's the Lisa. alternative. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, let's just wait for a minute for Lisa to get uh, back online if she's able to. Um, While we're waiting for Lisa, uh, can I make a comment, Sarah? Sure. So um, I agree with Mark that the minutes have become very condensed. I do go back to the video anytime I can and try to just make sure that at least my comments reflect what I think is substantive. I try not to go on and on, but if there are different points, and in this particular set of minutes, there were probably five or six different points that I felt were um, uh, something that I felt was important to convey to the applicant, especially since this was a concept review, and they didn't make it into the notes. And so um, I understand the staffing constraints and that it takes a lot of time to do a good set of minutes and it's not fun. It's not a glamour job. Um, I do think as a facilitator that the purpose of meeting notes or meeting minutes is that other people and, and ourselves, if we want to look back in the future from at what we did in the past, that we um, get the salient, important, substantive points of what was said and any decisions made. And, um, you know, I totally support being as brief as possible while still uh, keeping things substantive. So in terms of continuing these notes, I'm happy with the changes that I made. If other folks feel that they would indeed go back and um, make sure that these minutes reflect their substantive input, if they would like to do that, I'm happy to support a continuance. For me, the bigger issue is, um, you know, moving forward, what are these minutes going to look like and what's going to be captured? All right, Lisa, you're back. Thank, thank you, Laura. You're she has a comment in the chat. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, do you want to, Lisa, do you want to also get a, get a phone connection going so we can see you, but you can talk into the phone? Okay. <laughs> I think that was a very yes. Very expressive, Lisa. That's very expressive. Okay. So, um, Lisa, are you okay, even though we, you weren't able to put in your comments to, for us to go ahead and do a continuance? Okay. Mark, do you want to make a motion? I think it'd be super simple. 
I move to continue the approval of the April 25th planning board meeting minutes to a future date as determined by the chair and staff um, as determined as best determined by the chair and staff. All right, perfect. Do we have a second? I will second. Laura will second. Okay, we have to do a voice vote. Kurt? Yes. Uh, ML? Aye. Mark? Yes. Laura? Aye. George? Sure. Uh, Sarah is an aye, and Lisa sent us a text saying she was also in support of it, but I don't know if that can be counted. So it's either 6-0 or 7-0. Laurel, tell us what we're allowed to do. 6-0. 6-0, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, we will now move on to public participation, but uh, before we start public participation, uh, we are going to ask Vivian to remind the public of the rules and regulations uh, of public participation. And just a reminder, this is your opportunity as a member of the public to talk about any issue you would like that is not either item 5A or 5B of today's public hearing items. So if you wanna talk about an increase in the length of time for approval of land use or uh, 1345 28th Street, please hold your comments till later. This is an opportunity to talk about anything else but those two things. Go ahead. Great. Great. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks, Amanda, for pulling up the slides. We have a few people here from the public tonight. So thanks a lot for taking your time to attend the meeting. Uh, my role is to help facilitate public engagement parts of these meetings. And the rules I'll share now quickly um, are in place to help us achieve a balance between transparency with community members and security that minimizes disruptions. Um, and planning board We'll start with open comments, as Chair mentioned, and there are two public hearing items later in the agenda. We really want our participants to know that the city is striving into a vision co-created by city staff and community for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. And this vision is really designed to promote free conversation and dialogue, while also recognizing that we want to make sure everyone who's participating feels safe and welcome. And we want to ensure we make space for different viewpoints in our meetings. Next slide. And we do have a lot of information on our website uh, about what we call uh, as an umbrella, our productive atmospheres vision. If you wanna find out more, you can go to our website, but I'll focus on a few things for this specific meeting tonight. We have rules of decorum that are found in the Boulder revised code. And we have some general guidelines that are advisory in nature to share with all of our meeting participants this evening. First, we ask that all remarks and testimony raised tonight be related to city business. And we will not allow any participant to make threats or use any forms of intimidation against any person in this session. Obscenities, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts the meeting or otherwise makes it impossible for us to continue is prohibited. And we do also ask that participants identify themselves by the name they are commonly known by uh, and to display their first and last name before speaking so that we may call on you and we know who's providing the input. Next slide. We're all in the Zoom webinar format and it allows participants from the public to speak at designated times, but we will not be turning on video for community members because of security concerns in this platform. As I mentioned, we need a full name associated with each person's participation in the meeting um, and we cannot unmute you without your full name. So if your full name is not currently displayed and you plan to speak, please change it. You can right click on your name um, or send it to me in the Q&A and I'm happy to change it for you. There's no pre-existing list to speak, so you just you'll need to raise your virtual hand and on your screen you'll see a couple of different ways to do this. At the very bottom of your screen you'll see a horizontal menu with three clickable items. If you click on the hand icon it'll raise a hand next to your name and that's how we'll know to, to call on you. Next slide and if you have an expanded menu, you can also get to the oh sorry maybe previous one. Also get to the raise hand icon by clicking on reactions. Um, and it doesn't look like anybody's participating by phone, um, but in case you are, you can dial star nine to raise that virtual hand. That wraps up these rules and regulations. Thank you. And we can move into the wait, wait, Vivian, just open comment. Um, oh. Amanda, Amanda, are you there? Yeah, Amanda. She just has I, her camera I am. Off, I, I apologize. All I had a little bit of a glitchy internet. 
Sorry. Um, so Lisa just texted me that she's trying to call in, but the meeting ID oper uh, interface for her does not include a call in option. Can you, um, huh. can, can you help her? Uh, yes, I will. I'll send her um, an email and try to try to fix that. Okay. So I see that she's back on without audio. I mean, she's, she's muted. Lisa, can you unmute for a moment? Lisa Smith, can you hear us? Can you, can you talk for a moment, Lisa? Not working. Okay. Mm -hmm. Amanda's going to get in touch with you and uh, work through this with you. Okay. Sorry, Lisa. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. We're just in public participation right now, Lisa. Um, all right, Vivian, please go ahead and um, let's, Whoever has their hands up will start. Publishing. Yeah, so we, I see one. If other people would like to speak, please go ahead and raise your hand so that we know how many people there are. Um, and each person will have three minutes. So first we have Patrick or Rourke. Please go ahead. You have three minutes. Um, thank you, Planning Board. Uh, my name is Patrick O'Rourke. I'm the Preservation Chair for Historic Boulder. I wanted to take this opportunity to number one, thank Laura and Mark for monitoring the landmarks boards, because I know it's along with your very busy agenda, it's just one more activity that you have to do to be on the planning board. However, we do believe it's a critical, um, critical thing that you do. Uh, on May 30th of this year, uh, the historic Boulder, the Friends of the Banshaw and the Tea House submitted a application for a civic historic district and uh, it's going to be held uh, the, the initiation hearing is going to be on July 12th and we're going to request that uh, the, the um, landmarks board hear it within 60 days which could put it as early as September and currently it's on the October 4th agenda the reason for reaching out to you is twofold number one is I know you're a have a very busy agenda. So I wanna make sure that we're added onto that agenda sometime in September, October, but no later than your first meeting in November. The reason for that is that we've spoken at city council now, um, July of last year, June of last year, uh, at which time James Hewitt, the current, or at that time, the, the city historic planner suggested that the Civic Historic District would be a, a, a good idea and that the Landmarks Board and the city would bring it forward to the city council in the third quarter of 2023. The only way that could occur is if, um, if the planning board responds within the, the 45 days of when the hearing is. So I'm um, just letting you know about it more than anything else. Um, I spoke at the last city council meeting and uh, city, city Council asked staff if there's a way that they could hear it before they moved off, which I believe their last meeting is uh, December 7th. So the reason for this inquiry is that I don't think anybody on the planning boards ever heard of historic district. And I wanted to make sure that there's a questionnaire because the planning board has to determine that it meets the land use implications according to the Boulder um, comprehensive plan and I didn't see a place where there is a checklist so I'm asking staff whether that's um, somebody on this board or um, I believe it's uh, Brad whether we could get that checklist early so we could help fill it out and on that note I want to thank you for your service thank you so much I don't see any other hands raised give it a couple more seconds Lynn has raised her hand, Vivian. Yeah, please go ahead, Lynn. You have three minutes. Um, uh, just ditto that for me from Patrick. Um, and let's see here. First of all, I would really like to see who's at this meeting. Um, that is not impossible to do. You can either have a list of participants or you can have gallery view. Um, I like to see all of you, so maybe it's good to have you on gallery, gallery view since there's so many, you know, and you don't want it shrunken down to little tiny bits. But um, 
I like to see um, not only who I'm talking to, but I think you should like to see who you're responding to, who your public is. I exist more than in some deep, dark shadow of a place for you. And I also like to know who I am here with. I'd like to know if Patrick is here and without him speaking, there are many people that don't speak. And I'd like to know when Patrick leaves. And that's something I can do, not even when I'm live can I be monitoring that. But on the participants list, I can see who's there, who's gone, when, what they heard. Those are important things for me to know. Who my community is, who the public is, who's interested in what. And I think one of the main things is the integration of all the boards in Boulder. And as was discovered lately with Caroline Miller, who was just fired from the OSPT, she is the one person I've heard of in Boulder that follows many boards that I do, especially planning board and tab. Um, and she's on, she was on OSBT and RAB and the really critical boards in this town that form public policy. And there's so much integration of what happens from one board to the next. For example, CU South and its development instantly jumped the population of this town, doubled it, and doubles also the OSBT um, deficit of 300 million um, to multiples of that, and all of the other expenses of, of the infrastructure that we have for our community. Um, I also want to recommend that you do something about individual land use. And I've just sent you something that you can read about this, about multi-generational multi housing that needs to be incorporated mainstream into Boulder housing and will spread out throughout the country because there's a, a, a real big demand for socialization of people that they don't have, multi-generational socialization. Thank you, Lynn. Thank, Thank Lynn. you for your comments. Really appreciate it. Any other hands up? No, no other hands All up. Right. All right. Um, and Lisa, are you with us? Yes, excellent. Okay. All right. Now we're going to move into discussion of disposition planning board call ups and continuations. There are four of them. We'll go through each one. Call up item. 1100 Folsom Avenue site uh, site review amendment LUR 2023-00015. Uh, does anyone want to call this up? ML and Kurt. So ML first and Kurt. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I, I have a question. Um, hi, Chandler. Are you here to answer a question? <laughs> yes, hi. Um, so my understanding is that um, this um, item is looking to remove the PUD, to remove the quote hospital park from the PUD, which will allow it to be reviewed using form based code standard versus, I think the language that the staff had was valid site review and use review. Is that correct? It just puts it on a different track. Yes. Yeah. The the code says that if there's an existing PUD that applies to a property, that that property uh, isn't eligible for form-based code review. Mm -hmm. And so we adopted the form-based code to apply to the hospital site um, for the Alpine Balsam redevelopment, but it was in a PUD. So they're essentially shrinking the PUD to free up um, the majority of the hospital site to be submitted under form-based code review. Mm -hmm. So my second question, um, well, there it's my understanding that um, Boulder Junction was going to be looked at for the success for how form-based code, um, performed. Has that been done? 
Do we know if form-based code is giving the results we want? Yeah, I, don't think that, I don't think that form-based code is any longer considered a pilot. I think there was a post-mortem that was done um, as part of the 30 Pearl development. I don't know that it was done in any formal way, but um, I, I think that there was analysis that was performed and tweaks that were made as we started talking with our consultant on the Alpine Balsam form-based code from lessons learned. Um, on the uh, Boulder Junction uh, area where we did form-based code. ML, so I think the answer is um, yes and no, ML. Um, but I don't think it's I don't think it's considered a pilot anymore. I think um, we've embraced um, legislatively the form-based code as a tool. ML, can I just like so when we voted on um, Alpine Balsam, I don't know who else was already here. Um, we approved a, a modified, or we approved some, the form-based code we approved is not exactly the same form-based code that was approved at Boulder Junction. Right. It, it was, it picked uh, this, this, the staff identified parts of it that they wanted to apply, not the whole form-based code. So it's not meant to look like uh, uh, TVAP. Correct, I, I did look at the um, form-based code, which is, in our code. Uh, so I guess my big question I'm grappling with about, about this is um, what, uh, so in looking at the form-based code as it is in the code right now, and I see it's got the map for the Alpine Balsam project. It doesn't identify, um, it doesn't identify view quarters. Um, the way it did for the Boulder Junction site, they were very, it was very clear there was view corridors to be, and that was in the form-based code. There is nothing spoken to about the Alpine Balsam. There is nothing spoken to about in existing environmental factors. There's a creek, Goose Creek and its watershed are underneath that site. Um, and that isn't acknowledged as um, in the significant um, existing features. Um, it also talked about, uh, well, there are trees and luckily somebody went out there and put, you know, the orange protections around all the trees. There are significant trees surrounding that site, um, which could be impacted by the construction. So I'm, I'm wondering if there are deficiencies such as I pointed out, and those are only just, you know, the ones that I um, am bringing forward in the form-based code, how will those things get uh, captured and, 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 and how will they inform? How will the views, how will the Goose Creek, how will they actually inform the next steps? I understand that this wants to happen and it wants to happen so that the project can be expedited, can go forward. Um, but I'm just curious as to what will we lose by not going through a use and site review? So we did go through, we did go through a site review, ML. And Goose Creek, if you look at the plans for the hospital site, Goose mm -hmm. Creek, they're, they're creating on the northern edge of the site right. an entire, wa uh, entire right. water management system, which is where Goose Creek would flow when Goose Creek flows. Mm. So it's a, it's, um, it's a little messier than that, but I, I hear what you're saying. So Chandler, is there, am I making sense? I'm just trying to understand um, what does the form-based code not put on the table that a use and site review would? Um, you know, I think that's a, it's a pretty broad um, kind of consideration. Um, I mean, the way I understand it and the way that, um, you know, I think city staff understands it is that the Alpine Balsam area plan was adopted after a lengthy public process to determine what we wanted for that site and for that area. Mm -hmm. The form-based code was created specifically to implement the vision of the Alpine Balsam area plan. Um, site and use review criteria are much more general in nature. So I think when we were adopting the area plan and the subsequent form-based code, um, these factors that you're discussing were were taken into consideration and and 
the end result, what was adopted was what people thought was appropriate for the site. So um, really they're just trying to implement the Alpine Balsam area plan as it's been adopted through the public process um, to, to essentially not allow it to go through form-based code review. I don't think it would come through site and use review um, right. because the right because the the form based code like it, it would just be it would just remain as a um, demolished site until some later time when um, someone else came up with another idea for it. But really, even then, if they came in for site review, they would still have to meet or demonstrate consistency with the comp plan and with the Alpine Balsam area plan. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of a it's kind of a conundrum, I guess. If, if they weren't to go through form-based code review, I don't know that site and use review would get us anything extra because um, just by nature, it would kind of not be consistent with what the Alpine Balsam area plan anticipated. Yeah, I think that's well said, Chandler. I think the whole point of the form-based code was to very prescriptively be able to implement the vision that was found in the um, Alpine Balsam area plan. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Kurt, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'm not interested in calling this up, but I just had a question. It seems like we're dissolving most of the PUD, right, and just leaving these remnants of the pavilion and the parking garage. Is there any purpose in keeping the PUD at all? Could we just dissolve the entire PUD at this point? Um, theoretically, I guess the um, I think the applicant has has some strategic reasons for wanting to keep part of the PUD. I know part of it was that um, the existing parking garage is part of the PUD, the city-owned parking garage. Um, so to allow the parking garage to kind of continue to be tied in a regulatory fashion to the pavilion building, um, which I think is important for right now, since they're not planning to redevelop those until a later date, um, the PUD boundary it was decided that the PUD boundary should remain in place for those two lots. Um, also, the there's an adjacent building. The um, sorry, the name of the building Brenton. is the yeah, Brenton building. building. There's also a plan to to bring the Brenton building eventually into the PUD theoretically to um, make that part of the expanded city yeah. campus. So it's it's all it's essentially regulatory gymnastics that we're doing right now. Um, but there there is reason reasoning behind all of it um i can't really explain it that well to be honest i'm sorry okay well it sounds like it's been considered and and that's the decision that's been made so i just want yeah, to it has. I, I don't i don't think that we're quite done manipulating the pud to uh chandler's point um there's going to be some other subsequent moving uh pieces that we're going to have to address as this progresses but um this is the initial step i think that gets us um into the realm of form-based code review. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So ML, did you wanna call this up? No, okay. Next item is call up item floodplain development permit FLD 2023000004. Um, does anyone have questions or want to call it up? No, and we lost Mark somewhere. I'm gonna assume that means no for him. Um, was that a no? Okay. Uh, item C, 4C, call up item Boulder Sewer Main Replacement, uh, WET 2023-00002. Anyone want to ask questions or call up this item? Okay. Item 4D, call up item remapping of wetlands at Wonderland Creek and 19th Street, WET 2023-00003. Kurt, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just have one question again. So this is removing, as I understand it, this is removing areas of wetland, right? That with things that are currently classified as wetland that shouldn't be classified as wetland, right? And yet for 1895 Redwood, it says the city is finalizing purchase of this property under the provisions of the high hazard zone property acquisition program. So I'm wondering how it's not a wetland yet it's in the high hazard zone. Is that right? It just seems odd. 
Yeah. Hi, Kurt. This is Kristen Shepard. I'm the flood and wetland administrator and my camera is not working, so I apologize. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it does seem odd, but the, I think the main difference here, I can see how you that question would come up. The main difference is that the high hazard zone is mapped based on a 100 year flood coming down Wonderland Creek and wetlands are mapped based on soil that is consistently wet over um, a period of time. So even the Army Corps um, of Engineers doesn't designate this area as a wetland because it's essentially a small ish ditch. But if it was, if there was a hundred year storm event, um, that would be quite large. The water would be quite large. Does that make sense? That does make sense. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Okay, so you, Kurt, you do not want to call it up? Okay. All right. So we are done with call ups, dispositions, and continuations. Wait, Lisa, howdy. What do you want to say? Okay, you're just there. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're now gonna move on to the public hearing items. We have two today. The first is um, a potential increase in the length of time of approval of, that, of land uses, potential, potentially increasing the length of time that approval of land use is valid. Um, I was informed today that this has already passed first reading of city council. So we're kind of backtracking a little bit so we know what's going on since this is about land use and Brad, I think you take it away, yeah? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. I wanted to provide some introductory comments before uh, Lisa does her uh, presentation. Um, we as staff really see this as a housekeeping item. Um, I know in the staff report, we referenced some of the impacts of COVID, uh, but it really gets to a larger uh, direction that we got from council at their retreat this last, I guess it was February, um, in asking staff to open up um, the code books and look at how things that are embedded in the code are elongating process where maybe they don't need to. Uh, we have gotten, and I personally get these, as you can imagine, gotten a significant number of uh, comments of frustration from uh, applicants and folks going through process um, who, uh, I think, you know, in our judgment, uh, rightfully have concerns that the process has kind of uh, gotten in the way in some instances for uh, timeliness. Um, and we're not talking about substantive things where, you know, checks and balances are important. We're very sensitive to that, too. And we know that that um, has been the history and, and direction of, uh, of the city. Uh, but we're talking about things that are uses um, that existed as a restaurant, for example, and were vacant for a year, in this case, more than a year, and then just were another restaurant, uh, which in, every, in any other circumstance would just be another tenant finish, which we do dozens of on a regular basis. Um, we have gotten reports of people spending literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in rent, where they rented space, found out they had to go through a use review, um, that really substantively didn't change anything that wouldn't have already been addressed through a building permit. Um, so this um, can be considered as uh, a very short uh, and, and quick uh, addressing of timeframes, uh, but do know that we are working towards a larger uh, list for council to consider probably somewhere near the end of the year, or maybe first quarter, of um, items that are relative to code and process uh, along the lines of the direction that they uh, gave us at their retreat. And I'm happy to answer any questions about that context, otherwise uh, happy to just turn it over to Lisa. Uh, any questions or right now? Okay, so we'll turn it over to Lisa for your Thank you. presentation. Thank you, Brad. Hey, great. Thanks for that context, Brad. Good evening, planning board. It's nice to see you all. I have a very brief presentation. I feel like I don't usually give you brief presentations, so I'm glad to have a brief one to give you. Uh, this is, as Brad said, and teed up really well on the land use approval expirations ordinance. You all are seeing this. Um, the purpose of this tonight is for you to make a recommendation to the city council on ordinance 8581, which was in your packet and relates to these use review approval and conditional use approval expirations. So the current um, regulations in the land use code related to when an approval expires, 
vary based on the type of approval. So a use review is only valid for one year if the use is ever discontinued. So if the business goes or if the business goes out of business for a year, um, that's considered the use is discontinued. And so after a year that use expires, there is an option or the use review expires, there's an option to extend that by six months. With a conditional use, they the um, it expires after one year, no option to extend. However, we have other types of approvals like site review and form-based code review, which have longer expiration periods. Um, so it's three years for each of those with options to extend beyond that. So that's the current state of the, the expirations. The proposed ordinance makes a few simple changes. So for the use review and conditional use approvals, rather than one year, they would not expire for three years. Um, and then an, another important part of the ordinance is that the city manager is authorized by the ordinance to extend approvals that expired during the COVID-19 pandemic. As Brad mentioned, we had a number of businesses um, go out of business while during the during the pandemic and did not either that business did not come back um, within one year or uh, the property lost the use review approval and like in Brad's example another restaurant wouldn't be able to take over that use review because it had been more than a year. So that would be the change that you'd see um, made through this ordinance. Uh, you would have noted in your memo, I noted uh, several comprehensive plan policies that this helps support, namely in our economy section. So supporting local business and business retention, economic resilience, responsive to changes in marketplace, such as a pandemic, um, as well as high performing government and things like that Brad touched on as well. The next steps for this ordinance, as Sarah mentioned, it already had first reading due to the recess um, and the, the kind of odd schedule in summer. This is just kind of how the dates worked out. But um, first reading was that city council last week and passed, and then they will see second reading and have a public hearing on July 20th. All ordinances go into effect 30 days after the, the city council passes something. So if it was adopted, it would be effective August 19th. I do have a suggested motion. It's the same one that's in your memo, but I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, hey, uh, Laura first, and I also have questions, but if others don't, please raise your hand, Mark. Laura, Mark, and we'll see who else has questions. So I think uh, this is wonderful. I know we're not commenting, but um, I just want you to know I'm in support of giving businesses some extra time here and to not have to go through an unnecessary additional review. Uh, most of my questions have to do with how we're defining the COVID-19 pandemic. And so what period of time are we defining as the COVID-19 pandemic? And there's a clause about authorizing the city manager to reestablish land use approvals that expired during that time period. Can the city manager do that indefinitely? Like, could they go 20 years in the future and then look back to COVID-19? Or does, is there a certain time period in which the city manager can reestablish those approvals? Yeah, that's a great question. So we did um, set a specific time period. So it is May. It's any use that was due to the in, indirect effects of COVID-19 pandemic that was discontinued on or after May 10th, 2020 and December 31st, 2024. So if they hit the expiration period at any point during that um, for almost four year period, then the city manager would be authorized to extend that approval. And that's indefinitely, like the city manager could 10 years from now look back to December 2024 and reestablish a use that expired during COVID-19? Yes, I believe so. That's how that would work. Okay. And why, why is that, that there's no like time frame for making that decision? Like, do we think that that's needed to have it be indefinite? It just seems like that might be something that could be abused in the future by an unnamed, unknown city manager in the future. Yeah, I think that's something we hadn't discussed um, the potential to kind of abuse that. I think the thinking is perhaps something would be vacant for five years. And, um, you know, in the restaurant example, maybe that property has been vacant for five years, but they had the use review um, approval. And that just happened to that the business uh, left during COVID. Um, and so that use review, it's the fact that COVID extended longer than one year. And so there wasn't that opportunity for businesses to come back in because there weren't new businesses really opening up during COVID. So it was a unique circumstance. And that's why we've set that time limit of only businesses that had that expiration there. It's 
um, I don't know the exact numbers of how many businesses um, would be or properties would be under that within that time limit, but I think it's fairly limited. Okay, thank you. Mark. Um, you know, I'll, I always tell people like, listen to what I say, don't try to interpret what you think I'm thinking. So I'm just gonna ask Brad and staff a couple of questions. And uh, is, this, is this prompted by the Raising Cane's denial of use? No. Not at all. Yeah, no. Okay. Um, would the Raising Cane's denial of use be subject to city manager's uh, reinstatement of use? No, if Raising Cane's wanted to file another application um, for the location on 28th Street, they'd be required to undergo a full use review. This doesn't forgive um, applications, or, or should I say operators that have never gone through the process. So, so in other words, these are for properties that already had had a use for, Correct. for that same use in the past. Right. It's essentially a continuation of that use. For the same business. For the same, uh, not the same company necessarily, but the same type of use of well, the, a restaurant for a restaurant, a retail for retail, but right. not, not one that would involve site design either, right? So if it's adding a building or adding a drive through or things like yeah, that. Yeah, a subsequent operator would have to assume all of the operational characteristics that were approved in the original use review. So you wouldn't be able to add a drive through You wouldn't be able to extend your hours of operation. You wouldn't be able to add more seating. All of those things would trigger a new use review. Um, it would just allow you the opportunity to pick up where the use left off. Okay, so just confirming, and you anticipated my question, which is, had this ordinance been in effect uh, a little, about a year ago, would Raising Canes have had to gone through a use review if, if this ordinance was in effect because it was a drive-through at some point and that and the discontinuance, my understanding is the discontinuance of the use as a drive-through, even though it was a drive-through liquor store for a little while, um, what a lot, was what prompted the use review that we subsequently denied. So my question is, if this ordinance had been in effect, would the raising would raising canes have had to go through use review or could they have created a new drive a drive through uh, under the prior use? Yes, they would have been required to undergo a new use review. Um, while the drive through use when it was a liquor store had expired and we do have a provision that relates directly to drive through uses there was never an existing use review on that property so raising canes would have never been able to um, to reassume it and the fact that the drive through use was vacated um, for more than a year we're not changing that section of the code um, if, if there's a, a drive through that's vacant for a year, um, you're undergoing a new process. Okay. And, and, and the last, my last question is, um, as I looked at the uh, time frame to go from one year to three years, but not increase the extension period. Anyway, I, I did, do you guys ever consider having a two year use review window? Um, and then a one-year extension. If someone's going to come back and go through the extension process, actually, the the short thing seems to be the for me the six-month period of an extension. Did did you discuss extending the extension period and or shortening going from one to two years rather than from one to three years? Yeah, I think going back to Brad's initial points, this is really intended to eliminate some additional processes that businesses have to go through. So if we were going to have a two-year 
period and then an extension period that would likely be approved, that's just another step for businesses to have to go through. And because we already used three years for our other approvals, like site review and form-based code review, it really just aligns our processes so that the timelines, and there's often buildings or properties that are going through both use review and site review. Um, and so it aligns those timelines better to just use the same um, three-year period. And that's where we landed. Great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, Kurt, and then ML, you had your hand up. Do you still have a question? Okay, so Kurt, you go ahead, please. I wanted to clarify something that Charles just said, because I, Charles, if I understood you correctly, I thought you said that this only applies to applications that are not established, not uses that are abandoned for a period of time. And yet that's not how I read section five here. It says any conditional use approval that is not established within one year of its approval, which is what we were talking about, comma, discontinued for at least three years or replaced by another use of land shall expire. So it sounds like the also if you don't if you don't use the the use for its approved use for two years and nine months, you can still reestablish it without going through use review. That's right, but you have to have a use review first for these regulations to get that relief. There has to be an existing use review on the property um, in order for it to expire and uh, it to be revived. Okay, okay. And one other quick question then, um, when the city manager can grant an extension, it's from, it's six months from the original date of expiration, not six months from when the it's granted, right? So in the situation that Laura was asking about earlier, if it's 10 years on, then, then that's long past six months from the original date of expiration, right? Well, in those Am circumstances, Oh, sorry. Were you uh, I, I, I'm just wondering if I'm reading that right. So in those circumstances, like if the use has been gone for 10 years, it isn't necessarily extending their approval or it's not an extension of like the three year approval from before. It would just be that the new use coming in or the business coming back would be able to restart that use. Um, because they went out of business during COVID, where in other circumstances, whether it's one year or three year, if you're at 10 years past, um, you wouldn't be able to just restart that use. Um, but in this circumstances, in the limited circumstances of businesses that went out of uh, business during COVID, uh, then they can assume that use review without having to go through the use review process. But to get back to what Charles said, they have to assume the exact same operating characteristics, which is not um, I mean, there's a lot of different operating characteristics. So you'd have to have the same hours of operation, like Charles said, same seats, same everything to be able to assume that same, that approval. Um, so the likelihood of, uh, if it's a new business of it, it being exactly the same, um, might be, might be limited after 10 years. Okay. Okay. I think I was confusing section four and section three J, which are both changing. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so before I call on myself, anybody else have questions? All right, I'm going to call on myself up, oh, Laura. Just real quick. So um, I, I think it might have been our last meeting. Uh, Zomama was moving into Chipotle, but Chipotle's use review had expired. Would this ordinance have made it so that we did not have to spend our time on that Zomama uh, use almost, review? It's a great question. This is almost in direct response to situations like that. Um, of which we have uh, a number of them at this point. So um, yeah, they wouldn't have needed to undergo use review if we had these provisions adopted. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, anyone else before I call on myself? Okay, 
Um, so I want to appreciate Laura bringing up um, the uh, tenure, the, the, the hypothetical, you went out of business during COVID and 10 years later, you're somehow magically able to go back to business in exactly the same spot with exactly the same conditions of use, running the exact same business. It strikes me that we're creating a very big ordinance to solve a very specific problem. And the very specific problem is businesses that went out of business and during COVID and now want to come back. And I'm just wondering if it might make more sense to make this a more limited ordinance. And maybe you add a year of, um, instead of it being three years for any business, it's an additional year uh, for any business um, and a end date for COVID businesses, um, that businesses that went out of business during COVID. It just seems like the, the open-endedness of the of the ordinances is a is something that um should be made should be closed um and uh and i also so that's one thing i would i would like to suggest um, and we can discuss it uh later but um i'm also you know if a business is at let's restaurant x it goes out of business 10 years later, they want to reopen the exact same business in the exact same place with the exact same hours of operation, but the uh, world around them, around the business location has changed. And the hours of operation, which allowed outdoor drinking until 1 p.m., 1 a.m. in the morning, it's now in the middle of a more residential area than it was 10 years previously. Like, I feel like we're not, we're sort of uh, not taking into account the possibility that uh, things change, <laughs> even if the business owners don't change what their business is, what's around them could change. And it doesn't really give space for um, rev revising various uses or hours of operation. Here we're just talking about restaurants in a way that might reflect what the new neighbors of a business that's been closed for 10 years might, might prefer. And I think that's, uh, that's something we need to be cognizant of. So those are my thoughts. I don't know if anyone has any, any more concerns, thoughts. Okay, is, all right. Um, is there an applicant or do we go now to our discussion? You can move right to discussion. Well, I think you need to do public hearing. Yeah, for the public oh, hearing. Sorry. Thank you, thank you, Lisa. Um, all right, public hearing uh, on this uh, matter. Uh, Vivian, do you need to reread the, information no no need okay. so we would just look for um people's hands you would raise your virtual hand and we'll call on you in the order that the hands are raised and each person would have three minutes All so right. i don't see any so far so okay. Vivian, you're, you're now inviting members of the public to raise their hands if they'd like to speak to this topic correct okay, okay. Lynn, please go ahead. You have three minutes. I don't really have anything to say on on booze use reviews, but thanks. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. All right. So no any other members of the public who want to speak? I don't see any other hands raised. Okay. All righty. All right. So let's go to our discussion. Um, we have in front of us the uh, suggested language, although it's very hard to read at the moment. Um, and I don't know whether folks have thoughts about the language itself, if they're perfectly comfortable with it, if they want to uh, add any uh, recommendations or conditions. Uh, so let's, hands, any hands? Okay, Kurt, then ML, then Laura. Well, overall, I support this, but I think that Laura's point about um, the, the lack of expiration date is important. And so I could see adding some sort of expiration date to the city manager of, uh, authorization in section four. Thanks, Kurt. ML? Um, I, I agree with that. And I think Sarah, you spoke to that as well. That was my 
my initial question. And I, I, it does make sense that things that expired during COVID um, get an opportunity to come back, but it, it should not be indefinite. Okay, Laura. Thank you, Sarah and ML and Kurt. I think we're, we're starting to line up around this that we think that an expiration date is appropriate. And I think Sarah spoke well to this, but I think the entire purpose of use review or one of the main purposes is to make sure that the use um, is appropriate for the context. And as Sarah pointed out, the context can change in the future. And so uh, I guess I would ask staff, if this were going to have an expiration date, would you have a recommended expiration date for when businesses that went out of business during COVID should be allowed to be revived by the city manager? Like, should that be a period of three years, five years, seven years? Like how, how what, what is your sense of how long a business would need to be able to know that they can come back or have the finances to come back, assuming that their space is still available? I think we'd want to chat with the city attorney's office um, to decide on an exact number, but I think since one to three years is what we're talking about just for general expirations. Um, you know, if you think about a business that might have gone out of business at the very end, tail end of the pandemic um, before this ordinance is in place, uh, maybe three years after that, so that they can take advantage of the the advantage or the advantageous new code language that we're putting in anyway. Um, but I do think that I also want to discuss, um, it does say until 2020, December 30, 31st, 2024. So that also impacts businesses that might be closing now. So there's just some um, nuance that we'd want to talk through the exact date. Yeah. So can I just, can, Laura, can I just ask a follow-up question to Lisa mm -hmm. on this topic? Uh, a business that it's hard. I don't run a business, so I'm not gonna say that I know what's going on, but uh, the COVID pandemic is no longer a COVID pandemic. Um, and yet here we are with a date here that assumes that there are still businesses that are being impacted and might close up for the next year and a half. And I'm not, I'm not trying to make life difficult for small businesses, but I just don't quite understand the time frame that's that the city has created for this. Um, it, what is the significance of December 31st, 2024? How did you come up with that as the, the, the date, the, the businesses that would be uh, uh, specifically the businesses affected by COVID-19? Uh, and I assume that this is also a, an a ordinance that would work for it. Business X that closes January 1, 2025, just because it closed, but they would still be eligible because this is this, this is such a broadly written piece, I mean broadly applicable piece of legislation. Is that correct? Yeah, Charles, I kind of am looking to you if do you remember exactly because it's David here that drafted this part. Um, so I think the date was intended to be, you know, any use that might expire within the next year, taking into account um, this adoption process for this code change. And that's where I think the December 31st, 20, 2024 came from. Yep, I think that's where it came from. And I actually think we have an operator um, who is facing a, an expiration and won't be able to figure out um, transfer of the um, approval until after it gets out of it's going to be subsequent to three years so i think that's what it was born out of was a specific example i don't think it's um there's a number of them that are stacked but, up but this ordinance would be would be applicable to any business that goes out of business and they want to reopen in the same site not just not just covid business covid losses right this is not written in such a way that it's only businesses that can prove that they were closed because of impacts of COVID. Right. It just uses the timing as um, kind of the mechanism rather than the COVID pandemic effects. It assumes that that was um, part of the reason why they went out of business, but it does not specifically say that. Okay. So, so if you keep that time frame and then uh, there's a end date that's not indefinite, but an actual end date which might be 
three years from December 31st, 2024, which would then cover all the businesses that are potentially covered by this plus three years. Uh, that would that could conceivably solve, or I realize you want to check with staff and lawyers and all that stuff, but if you go, if if this, the three-year extension is for these specific set subset of businesses, and it's three years from December 31st, 2024, as the last date by which any of the businesses have that three-year extension, you would cover the universe of COVID-related closures. Is that correct? That sounds correct to me. Okay. So um, we're not lawyers and we're not the ones who write the legislation, but if we had a condition of approval that recommended to council, to staff, I don't know who we recommended to, that there be an end date for the application of this, for the utilization of this ordinance or the application of this ordinance, would that be the right language? Certainly, and I think that there's opportunity to clarify, especially that um, that section, section four of the ordinance. So you could just include in your motion, add clarity to section four about when the, the um, expiration of this uh, utilization of this flexibility would be or something like that. Okay. Um, uh, uh, I see that we have some hands up. Mark, Laura. Um, yeah. ML. Sorry, Mark, Laura, ML. Uh, maybe, and again, I'm looking to staff for guidance on this. You've heard us and some of these concerns, and I understand your concerns and saying, gee, we're going to go back to the city attorney's office. Would this be an opportunity rather than us trying to muddle through a motion that tries to convey something kind of indefinite? Would this be an opportunity to continue this item to next week? And you have revised motion language, suggested motion language for next week. We don't have a meeting on the books for next week, right? Our next oh, meeting is in a month. I think we're like four weeks from our next meeting. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm the sorry. Timing, the timing might be an issue because of the recess. No. Okay. All right. We'll deal with it now. Sorry. Uh, Laura and then ML. I just want to make sure I'm understanding correctly and that we're all on the same page that this ordinance does two things. One, it says any expiring use review or conditional review, instead of having a one year period where you can revive it, where you've gone out of business and then you revive it within one year, it's three years. Am I understanding that correctly? And that's and that goes on forever. That's for every business forever, nothing to do with COVID-19. The only thing that has to do with COVID-19 is this provision, I think it was section four in the ordinance about the city manager is authorized to reestablish land use approvals that may have expired during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so that, I'm, I'm guessing that is completely separate from this idea of expiring use reviews and conditional reviews that only have a one year window to go ahead and get your business up and running. Now you got three years to get your business up and running. This city manager looking back and reviving land uses is something different. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, you are. And I think it's confusing because it's a lot of the same language about expiring and things like that, but that's exactly correct. And I think, I think there is an opportunity to clarify section four and perhaps even just define what we mean by COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I think there's a lot of ways we could do that and we'd want to, um, probably have the flexibility to chat with our city attorneys and really craft that um, and just, but I think there's room for improvement for that section, definitely. Okay, so maybe Laurel could help us craft some language where we use staff suggested motion language, but we add a provision saying that we recommend that staff revise section four specifically so that there is an end date to this city manager authority to authorize, approve, and extend, or otherwise allow to restart or continue any land use approval, et cetera, et cetera. There's some end date that staff will help us determine, but it's not just an indefinite look back. Yeah, yeah, um, if I may jump in, if that's okay, Madam Chair. Um, if you use a suggested motion language as is, and then at the end we could say, and, and then something similar to what you said, request the staff add this language in there. Uh, yeah, I Laura, think that would be inappropriate. Laura, do you mind trying to draft the It'll be a half a sentence or a sentence that, that basically says what you just said. 
Okay. Or, or Laurel, would you want to do that? Or would you prefer that I take a stab at it? Um, either way, I'm happy to do it or have you do it. If you would prefer that, it's fine. I think it'd be great if you would do it since you're the okay. attorney. But sure. thank you, Sarah. Okay. Um, I have one more question, which is about what are the implications of a three-year window of an empty storefront somewhere? Um, like just from a, from a, Vital, a city vitality or city, I don't know what the right language is, but we're essentially get proposed, and I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but we're essentially creating the, the situa situation where business X goes out of business and their storefront is empty for three years while they try to figure out how to get themselves back up and running. And I, I just don't, like that seems perhaps not necessarily in the best interest of other small businesses that might be looking for storefront property. Just sort of curious, it's more of a, a, a policy question than a specific ordinance question. I'm just sort of curious how staff has thought about this. Yeah, I would say that, oh, it looks like Brad popped on too. So maybe he has, Brad, do you wanna go? Oh, go ahead. Okay. Well, I was just going to say that I think that improve the extension to three years improves the flexibility for that property, whether it's the business coming back or a new business coming in. So it supports a lot of those economic related policies in our comp plan. Um, it's supporting economic resilience and providing more opportunities. There are other uses that could go in that don't require a use review, but a use review is something that is an additional process, an additional fee. Um, it's additional uncertainty for a business owner. So having that flexibility for three years where at least this one kind of use that would typically require a use review or a separate process, uh, they have the assurance that they're able to go into that property. I think it probably actually in more circumstances um, supports that storefront getting a new business and rather than is a detriment. And I'll just add to that too, that I have um, heard uh, much more than I would say just anecdotally, but from um, uh, brokers and uh, folks that work with the business community and individual property owners, that um, businesses are literally avoiding coming to Boulder, not because there's a vacant space available for them or not because uh, rents are necessarily too high, although of course they are, but because they literally... Um, the, the city is developing a reputation that things that are presumed to be simply a tenant improvement or a tenant finish, um, now they're finding themselves going through a, a zoning process with a, a whole lot of requirements associated with it, which ultimately at the day, at the end of the day, really have very little to do with um, zoning or the operation of a, a unique use. Um, and so it really is that that's the context in which we're we're hearing this and bringing it forward. All right. Well, I appreciate you answering that question. Um, any more hands before we um, ask Lauren uh, Laurel about her her additional language for a motion? Okay, Laurel, can you? Um, I I think it would have to be Amanda who could throw up on the screen the motion language plus whatever addition, additional language Laurel um, has devised for us. Yes, I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Laurel. I was just gonna say, perfect. I think you have my language that I popped in the chat. I do, and I just put it into a Word document so I can share it now. Okay, great. Okay. Can you Great. make that can, can you make yes. it a bit bigger? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a little small. And I put the and in capital so you can see the part that I added. So everything after the and in capital letters. Perfect. Um, is what I added. All right. Um, I'll go ahead and read it and then we can uh, give feedback. Planning board recommend this is not, I'm not, I'm not making the motion. I'm just reading it. Um, Planning Board recommends that City Council adopt Ordinance 8581, amending Title IX Land Use Code BRC 1981, by increasing the length of time an approval of land use is valid after discontinuance to after discontinuance to three years, and authorizing the City Manager to reestablish land use approvals that may have expired during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
and setting forth related details and recommends uh, city staff amend section four of ordinance 8581 to provide an end date to the city manager authority to authorize, approve, extend, or otherwise allow to restart or to any land use approval due to the COVID-19 pandemic. There's a few little awkward. There's uh, there's a missing that. word there. It should say allow to restart or continue any land use approval. Thanks, Laura. Yes, I missed or, a word. <laughs> or, or to continue. It says or to continue any land use. Yep. Amanda, sorry, but there should be a two before continue. Allow to restart or continue. Perfect. Okay. Um, What, I, I just don't quite understand what the end setting forth related details. What is, what is that? That's our standard language for, um, okay. so for is, passing any sort of ordinance. It's the same thing that goes in city council packets, that okay, related so maybe, details. Okay, so maybe, it, maybe that's what's throwing me off is the, is the punctuation. We should end related, related details with a period. And then you can say. The, get rid mm -hmm. of the and and say planning board recommends city staff. Otherwise, because it just didn't make, it was a little weird before. Okay. Any of any input, thoughts, concerns, comments, haikus, anything at all? I have no concerns. I, I like this. I think uh, I'm very comfortable relying on staff to figure out what would be an appropriate period of time. Assuming I'm assuming that staff agree that having this be indefinite is maybe not necessary. And so, you know, what's an appropriate time to have that authority related to COVID-19? Um, and I would trust, you know, uh, whoever is leading here, Lisa, to work with the city's attorney's office and figure out what is that appropriate date. I guess I would just ask Lisa, would you foresee that the city's attorney's office might come back and say, this is a bad idea, don't do it, or? No, I think it's just an, an unintentionally vague part of the ordinance, so I think tightening it up would be great. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, any other, thank you, Laura, any other comments? All right, so we're, let's, uh, would someone like to, let's see if we, if I learned my lesson about motion making. Uh, Brad, do I need to read the motion? Or Laurel, do I need to read the motion? Somebody needs to make the motion, yeah. Okay, would so they'll have to like, read that. Would mm -hmm. someone like to make the motion? I can make the motion. All right. I move that uh, we make the following recommendation. Planning board recommends that city council adopt ordinance 8581 amending title nine land use code BRC 1981 by increasing the length of time an approval of land use is valid after discontinuance to three years and authorizing the city manager to reestablish land use approvals that may have expired during the COVID-19 pandemic and setting forth related details. Planning board recommends city staff amend section four of ordinance 8581 to provide an end date to the city manager authority to authorize, approve, extend, or otherwise allow to restart or continue any land use approval due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Do we have a second? A second. Okay, ML seconds. Uh, any questions, comments? All right, then I am going, whoop, I still need to read it. I need to read it one more time so that we can vote on it. Is that correct, Brad? I don't see you. Is that a yes or a no? Correct. So, since, okay. Um, okay, I, I'm now it, reading. It'd be appropriate so to read the whole thing. Thanks. It is appropriate? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, planning board recommends that city council adopt ordinance five uh, 8581 amending title nine land use code BRC 1981 by increasing the length of time and approval of land use is valid after discontinuance to three years and authorizing the city manager to reestablish land use approvals that may have expired during the COVID-19 pandemic and setting forth related details. Planning board recommends city staff amend section four of ordinance 8581 to provide an end date to the city manager authority to authorize, approve, extend, or otherwise allow to restart or continue any land use approval uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, 
can I, I'm, I've just read this and now I have a question. <laughs> I'm very sorry. So if it's not okay for me to ask the question, um, staff, just tell me legally. You can ask a question. Okay. In reading, in reading our addition, the additional sen uh, sentence, this could apply to any land use decision. Um, so I'm guess my question is, is the language of the ordinance specific enough that is understood that this applies only to um, retail establishments and not to uh, a, a built a, a development an approved development that it took 10 years to get off the ground. So the ordinance applies to any use that requires a use review. We've been using the example of restaurants a lot, but it's any use that required a use review. Um, but I think it's clear enough that since you're referencing section four, that this only applies to what the ordinance is focusing on. Um, does that answer your question? Laurel, did you have something else? Well, I, it, I mean, essentially what it could mean, and I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to do this, but what it could mean is project X is approved in 2021, 2020, it can't be built because of COVID. It takes another 15 years before they can build that thing, the, the mixed use project. We've just approved, this ordinance approves a 15 year extension, even if they themselves did not ask for whatever that tool is that some applicants do ask for, which is an extension of the three year time limit. Well, that's exactly why the clarification of putting an end date and that's that's the reason to have that. So we would have an end date. And also for those kind of situations, if there's a site review, they're subject to the site review, um, the expiration of three years anyway. So, okay. um, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I just I just want to point out that I, I do think in reading the ordinance, if we're going to get like legalese here, the ordinance does say authorizing the city manager to reestablish land use approvals. It just says land use approvals that may have expired during the pandemic. It does not, that sentence to me is not limited to use reviews and conditional uh, uses. So if that is what staff's intention was to limit that, I would suggest adding that in as well. Because the, the current language, like if a lawyer wanted to sue the city and say it just says land use approvals, it's not limited to uh, use review and conditional uh, uses. That or that section four doesn't say anything that limits it, and the um, and the umbrella language in the ordinance doesn't say anything that limits it, as far as I can see. Good catch, Sarah. So I don't know. Was that staff's intention to limit it to just those two things, or was it any land use approval that during COVID nineteen that you wanted the city manager to be able to revive? No, this is focused on use review and conditional use with their one year expirations. Okay, so I you so I think then we need to change the language. We need to vote on this one since you already read it out loud. Okay. So we'll have to vote on this one. And then if you want to change it again, if, if it fails, then, um, okay. so, um, then we can like, amend it again. Okay. Yep. Okay, Looks like Mark has it. Well, um, because it's been moved and seconded and read, does vote. that prohibit amendments at this time? We have to vote on this first. And then if it passes, we can have an amendment, correct, Laura? Laurel? No. But if it fails, then we just vote on another one, which is, it seems, would be my preference. We, we vote on this, preferably so, it fails, and then we do it again with the right language. Is that, that yep. okay. All right, so yeah, that it's, makes been, sense. it's been moved, it's been, the motion's been made, it's been seconded, I've read it, it's time for a vote. Uh, I will start with myself, I'm voting no. Mark? No. Uh, ML? ML, you're on mute. It vanished. Um, we're, we're wanting to amend this. OK, no. OK, Laura? No. Uh, Lisa? Lisa? No. George? No. Kurt? No. OK. Excellent. It failed. <laughs> Let's try this. Let's try this again. Um, so I've got I've got the um, little chart that uh, Halla gave us. We could have done a subsidiary motion. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we voted but anyway, down. yeah. Let's, let's vote this down. Let's correct the language and and vote it 
vote on it. So I think I, I have language to suggest. Perfect. Go ahead. Okay. I, can somebody type in real time as I'm talking? Okay. So uh, in the last sentence, planning board recommends city staff amend section four of the ordinance to specify that this applies to use reviews or uh, is it use reviews and conditional uses and provide an end date. But we still need to get you rid of the land use, any land use approval. Oh, and, um, continue any use review or conditional use approval rather than land use approval right so we i guess you get... could you could do it there you're right sarah that would be a better way to do it uh you have to you have to be clear what where you want what you want okay to do there. so in the in the last sentence the second to last line delete the words land use yeah the the second to last line there delete the words land use before approval and put in the words, uh, any use review or conditional use approval. Is that, are those the right terms, Laurel? Or Lisa, one or the other? <laughs> I think those are the right terms. Um, yeah, and the land use language was actually in the original ordinance is where I got that from. So I'm just making yeah. sure that we could, yeah. Yeah, so you would need to amend uh, uh, additionally, and make all of the um so at the end there after pandemic um add uh, and make language throughout the ordinance consistent with this change um something i just wanted to mention too as well i think since this is under the umbrella of um use review changes under the main title of the ordinance Mm -hmm. um, and the actual text of the ordinance is under our use review section. Yeah, we wouldn't need to change the language of the ordinance. Like the, the language throughout what you're talking about. It's already under our use review code section. Is it? Yeah, because it's under 9-1, like the actual ordinance language um, is under uh, subsection E, which says, existing use subject to specific use standards require use review or conditional use approval. So it kind of already has that use review. But umbrella. section section four, section four doesn't have a specific code section that it refers to. Section four of the ordinance, as far as I can tell. I, right, so we can amend section four, but we would need to, as far as I can tell though, though others, other staff may disagree with me definitely, but. No, the rest oh. of the ordinance we can leave yeah just if it helps clarify laura so there's sections of an ordinance which refer to different code sections and that's where you'll see like um whatever it is 9214 or whatever um and then there's sections that are just text like there they'll be often it'll be like we're doing this ordinance for the public health safety and welfare things like that that's not amending code text it's just uh -huh. a part of the ordinance mm -hmm. if that makes sense so that's split into different sections and that's how all ordinances are organized so it gets a little confusing because parts of it are code, land use code, and parts are just ordinance text. Right. And section four, I don't think is specific to any section of the land right. use code. And section right. four just says that it's any land use approval. So I think that was a really good catch by Sarah. And when I said make language throughout the ordinance consistent, I, I mostly was referring to the, uh, the very first paragraph that's in bold at the top of the ordinance that just says an ordinance amending Title IX land use code. And in that section, it says authorizing the city manager to reestablish land use approvals. And that needs to be specific to use review and conditional uh, use um, approvals. So, you know, maybe, I didn't know if it appeared elsewhere besides there, but that was one section where I could see it needed to be consistent. Whatever is in section four needed to be mirrored in that opening paragraph. So. That's, that's all that I meant by that, is that whatever we do in section four, anything else that refers to section four needs to be consistent. Does that make sense? I'm sorry, is that unclear? Do we need to change the language of our motion to make that more clear? No, I think that's fine. Um, okay. okay, Kurt and then Mark. Yeah, thanks to everybody for catching all this. 
I am just trying to understand. I did, also didn't understand that Section 4 wasn't actually modifying part of Title IX. So how would an applicant know that this provision exists uh, for th that authorizes the city manager to extend? How, if somebody you know, comes along six months from now, they didn't, weren't following this process, how do they know that this option even exists for them if it's not in Title IX? So there's still a record of adopted ordinances. And so, and the city would be administering it um, as such. So we would be giving them that information. Okay, so they would come in, it, it assumes that they come in at all, right? They might, they might look at the code and say, oh, I'm out of luck, right? Yeah. And and so it would only be if they came in to sort of appeal or to clarify that staff could tell them, oh, well, there's this option of, of asking the city manager in effect to extend. Right, and maybe I'll look to Laurel um, for more legal backing, but or background, but um, I think that often for things that are temporary in nature, it makes more sense to include it in an ordinance rather than to include it um, like in code text that we would eventually, um, it would become obsolete. So I think that that was the intention of why it's not written into the land use code, but it's rather just part of the ordinance. Yeah, and, and I can understand, I don't wanna clutter up the code with stuff that's going to be moved in a few years, but I'm just, and maybe, maybe it's not a particularly important concern, but I'm just concerned that, as I say, people may not realize that this opportunity even exists for them uh, and, and not even ask for it. That seems like a communications challenge for the city versus a, a motion challenge. Do you think, Kurt? Yeah, I, I I guess so. It would be nice if there were a way to put stuff in the code that would automatically delete itself <laughs> when it's no longer relevant, but that doesn't happen. So. Well, you know, we're pretty familiar with having to do this from time to time in administering our code of ordinances, so um, it's not unfamiliar territory for us. Okay. Um, Mark, did you just lower your hand? Yeah, I, I just I'll, I'll speak to anything uh, after the motion is made because there 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 is supposed to be discussion after the motion is made if people want it. So I'll 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 do it then. Thank you. Okay, I am going to read the motion. We'll have a discussion, then someone will make a motion, and then we'll go from there. So when, you actually need somebody to make the motion. Okay, so would someone please make the motion? Yes, and then second to then. I, I I do want to clarify that. It's not reading the motion and then someone makes the motion. Someone makes the motion by and then reading I read the it motion. Again, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Would someone like to make the motion? I can make the motion again. Thank you, Laura. Planning board recommends that the city council adopt ordinance 8581 amending title IX land use code BRC 1981 by increasing the length of time an approval of land use is valid after discontinuance to three years and authorizing the city manager to reestablish uh, I thought we changed that. Use review or conditional use approval that may have expired during the COVID-19 pandemic. And setting forth related details. Thank you for changing that in real time. Planning board recommends city staff amend section four of ordinance 8581 to specify an end date to the city manager authority to authorize, approve, extend, or otherwise allow to restart or continue any use review or conditional use approval due to the COVID-19 pandemic and make language throughout the ordinance consistent with this change. We have a second. I second. All right, Mark seconds. Okay, oh. discussion, discussion. Mark, you did something you wanted to tell us. Yes, two things. Okay. One, I think this is a brilliant example of crafting a motion that is dramatically improved over 
over the original proposal. And, and not, not to diss staff, I'm just saying this, this is like an example of the process working. And I also want to say that um, while it, it may seem extraneous, the, 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 the prescription to make language throughout the ordinance consistent with this change, I think, is, I think that is an important part of conveying our intentions because many times language is inconsistent <laughs> with, with a subsequent change. So anyway, I'm, I, I think this is a, a well-crafted piece and I certainly support it. Okay, Laura. Just want to speak briefly to the substance of this uh, ordinance, and I want to really compliment staff for listening to uh, our business community that uh, this is one of the pieces of regulation that can um, impose significant barriers with very little, if any, benefit to the city. And so I want to compliment staff for ferreting out this particular change that needed to happen, and thank you so much for bringing it to us. I think it's very supportive of the business community and the BVCP um, desire to make not, you know, not make things difficult, but make things better. And so thank you so much for bringing this to us and to city council and, and doing the work. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Laura. Any other comments? Uh, Kurt. Yeah, I'll just say I totally agree with what Laura said. You know, I think we have unfortunately a fairly well reserved reputation for not being particularly business friendly in Boulder. And I think that small things that we can do to improve that are great. And I feel that this takes a step in that direction. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. I'm going to go to a, I'm going to read the motion. We're going to go to a vote. Uh, Planning Board recommends that City Council adopt Ordinance 8581, amending Title IX Land Use Code BRC 1981 by increasing the length of time and approval of land use is valid after discontinuance to three years and, author and authorizing the City Manager to reestablish use review or conditional use approvals that may have expired during the COVID-19 pandemic and setting forth related details. Planning Board recommends city staff amend section four of ordinance 8581 to specify an end date to the city manager authority to authorize, approve, extend, or otherwise allow to restart or continue any use review or conditional use approval due to the COVID-19 pandemic and make language throughout the ordinance consistent with this change. Okay, time to vote. Uh, it has to be a voice vote. Uh, Kurt? Yes. ML? Aye. Laura? Aye. Mark? Aye. Lisa? Aye. George? Yes. Aye. Sarah is an aye, so it passes seven to zero. Okay. Did everyone vote? Yeah, everyone voted. Okay. I would like to recommend that we take a 10 minute break and then come back and do item 5B. Is everyone okay with that? All right. See you in 10 minutes.
Can I ask a question while we're waiting for folks to come back? This is just a curiosity thing. Um, in the world of architecture, what does a vertical expression of circulation mean? <laughs> is that like saying you can tell where the staircases are or I don't know, or ele elevators? I don't know what that means. What's a vertical expression of circulation? Why don't we ask that question of the applicant? Yeah, okay. I think it was in staff's description, so I might ask staff, but okay. I didn't want to take up time with that if we don't need to, but maybe ML knows. I missed your question. Did you? Oh, um, do you know what staff might mean when they say that the building includes vertical expressions of circulation? The best I could figure from Googling is maybe that it means that you can tell on the outside where the staircases and the elevators and stuff are, but I, I that, don't know. That would be the that would be the obvious answer. <laughs> okay. But there could be something unique for you never know. It just said that the building contains vertical expressions of circulation, and I don't know what that means. <laughs> stairs, stairs, stairs and elevators. Yeah, okay. sorry, I'm I'm late to the chat, Laura, but yeah, you're spot on. <laughs> it's really about how people um kind of move within the building so okay and does that mean you can tell from the outside that the building facade indicates where the staircases are or does it just mean that they have staircases <laughs> okay um is staff back okay, shannon's here wonderful thank you shannon um laurel are you here Okay, Laurel's here. Amanda, are you here? Okay. All right. We are calling ourselves back into order. We are going to have item 5B, agenda title 1345 28th Street Site and Use Review, LUR 2022-00021. Before we have our staff presentation, uh, we need to do a conflict of interest disclosure. Um, I will start. Um, so I am actually now a member of the Rocky Mountain Tennis Center that is located on the site. Um, I checked with Laurel, Lauren. I will get Laurel. I will get this correct eventually, Laurel. Please don't take offense. It's really <laughs> none taken. None taken. Ter terrible, terrible with names and faces. Um, and uh, she has determined that I do not need to be recused, um, but it is important that everybody know that I am a member of Rocky Mountain Tennis Center. And if it's okay, um, Chair, I was just gonna ask you a couple of questions just to make sure that we're all in the clear um, yeah. on the record. So the first question um, is making sure that you, um, or if you could confirm for me that you would be able to participate this in a way that is, um, uh, not bias or um, that you're able to be objective on this hearing item. Yes, I will be evaluating it based on the code. Great, excellent. Um, so just so everybody knows, um, we have a section in our code that talks about remote interest. And this is kind of the idea that it's a nominal of nominal nature since this isn't the main part of this particular item, um, then it would qualify for what's called remote interest, which if anyone wants to know a little bit more about that, it's under section 2-7-14 of the code which is how we came to our conclusion. Um, but there is a section that talks about disclosure. So since this is something that does touch on this item, we thought that disclosure would be best for everybody to know about. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Does anyone else have a conflict of interest disclosure? Okay, no. Okay, then let us get started. Uh, we're gonna start with a 15 minute staff presentation after which we'll take questions then the applicant will get 15 minutes and take questions, then we'll go to public hearing. And at that point, we'll see where we are and whether we wanna take another break or just go through discussion. Great. Well, thanks so much, Chair. Uh, members of the board, Charles Farrow, Planning and Development Services. Um, this last appeared before the planning board in November, 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Um, since that time, it's uh, made stops at both Design Advisory Board and Transportation Advisory Board as directed by uh, Planning Board and Council um, through the concept plan process. Um, via the site and use review process, it's been through multiple iterations with staff as well. So um, I'm pleased to introduce Shannon Moeller, our planning manager. She'll present staff's analysis this evening. So Shannon, please take it away. Oh. 
great. Thank you, Charles, for that introduction. Um, Shannon, you're gonna have to, Shannon, you're going to have to speak up or speak closer to the microphone. Uh, your voice is very muddled. Thanks for that reminder. Get a little closer here. Thank you. Okay. Um, so again, I'm Shannon Moeller, the case manager for this project uh, with the Planning and Development Services Department with the city. Um, I'll provide a brief overview. Um, we'll look at the planning process to date, the existing site and surround context, a summary of the proposed project, and key issues for discussion. In terms of the planning process so far, in November 2021, a concept plan was reviewed by the planning board. That concept plan was subject to city council call-up, and the council did not call it up. The item was referred to the Design Advisory Board and the Transportation Advisory Board. In May 2022, an application was filed for the proposed site and use review. The proposal has been through several rounds of staff review, as well as being reviewed by DAB in December 2022 and TAB in February 2023. So tonight, uh, the board is considering uh, this site and use review proposal. The site review is required based on the size of the property and the size modification. Sorry, Shannon. Shannon, again, your voice. I don't know quite what's going on, but you you sound like you're underwater. I'm not sure. Um, let me scoot up a little, a little closer. Okay, thank you. Try to project. Thanks for letting me know. Um, so the site review is required based on the size of the property and because modifications are being requested, including the proposed parking reduction and height modification. Um, this means the proposal requires a decision by the planning board. A use review is also proposed for the ground floor dwelling units that face the street, which requires a use review in this zoning district. As part of the review process, the site was posted and public notification provided per code Written comments received were included in the board's packet and transmitted to the board via email if received after publication of the packet. The public comments primarily included concerns regarding parking as well as the height of the proposal. Moving to the specific site and surrounding context next, um, it's a 15.8 acre property located west of 28th Street and south of Arapahoe. Boulder Creek runs through the site. The site contains the Millennium Harvest Hotel, a 60 foot tall five story building constructed in 1958. It's a modernist structure designed by Ralph D. Peterson, a Denver architect. It's been substantially altered since its construction due to multiple remodels, additions, and various alterations. The proposal of the structure has been reviewed and approved by historic preservation staff and archival records of the property have been prepared and provided to the city to document the property. It also contains 15 tennis courts used by the Rocky Mountain Tennis Center and other groups, and three existing cottages housing non-residential uses south of the creek. The property was annexed to the city in 1967, and a number of discretionary reviews have been approved on the property over time as listed in the staff memo. And, uh, Shannon, you are very hard to hear. I am so sorry if there's any way to improve the sound quality. Um, let me see. I could try to pause the presentation if you'd like and try to find a different um, microphone. So Shannon, what, what are you are you using a microphone on your laptop or a headset or what? Um, I could try to find an alternative to what I have now, if that would be helpful. Uh, why don't I just pause briefly? While Shannon is pausing, I want to say, um, I don't think this needs a disclosure, but I love this fish observatory. This is one of my first memories of Boulder. When my husband and I first visited here, before we moved here in 2008, we stayed at the Millennium and we walked on the Boulder Creek path and I was utterly charmed by this fish observatory. So I'm very glad to hear that it's gonna stay. Um, I don't know, have, you, have other folks gone to this? This is really just a, a lovely feature. I'm kind yeah. of curious to go there when the when the creek is in high, uh, high gear. I wish I had gone earlier this month. It's a pretty remarkable little jewel and not that many people know about it. I mean, I discovered it decades ago 
I hadn't gone in decades, but um, it's pretty cool because you go to see it at all the different times and you see the fish that are hanging out, you see the fish that are kind of swimming by and other things. Yeah, it is cool to really keep it. It's pretty wet down there right now, though. I was just looking at it this morning. And also, two, I hadn't noticed this before, but two of the windows are kind of either painted over or scratched up or something. So you can really only see through one, unfortunately. Sounds like maybe it could use a little bit of maintenance. I did see that in the agreement, there will be some kind of maintenance agreement. Right. Yep. Cool. So I'm in Florida right now hanging out with some relatives and uh, my dad and I went out in a two person kayak and uh, just love seeing all the fish and fish are breeding right now and I don't know if this is the same in Boulder but like they make these egg sacs that are like transparent like jelly like as you can see on the bottom of the uh, the bay here. Um, I just think it's so wonderful to be able to observe fish doing their thing um, in the natural environment not in an aquarium. This is a really cool feature. All right, Shannon, speak to us. I am back. I have a different microphone. Is this any better? Uh, it's a little muddy, but keep. let's give it a shot. Okay. I will try to speak loud again. I apologize. Thank you. Um, let's see. Let me find where we were. Okay. Um, so as you were discussing, the site contains a number of unique natural features. Trees along the creek and within the hotel courtyard, Boulder Creek serves as an urban stream corridor and the Boulder Creek multi-use path runs alongside as an important transportation corridor in the city. The site also contains a fish observatory. Shannon, you've just frozen. You know, I, I, I think actually now that I listen to it, it's more her internet connection than her microphone. Uh, but we'll, we'll carry on, but yeah. Uh, which impacts the and limits the placement of proposed buildings and changes to existing parking areas. In particular, the proposed buildings are required to be located outside of the high hazard zone and the lowest floor must be elevated to add or above the flood protection elevation. Shannon, you might want to try turning off your camera. You were freezing flood. up back there, and it might be your internet connection. So if you turn off your camera, that might give you better bandwidth. Sorry okay. to micromanage, but hopefully that will help. Maybe that will help. Um, so again, these flood constraints are a significant design constraint impacting the design proposal in question. Um, the areas surrounding the creek are also um, contain high functioning wetland and buffer areas which act to preserve and protect the wetlands. A wetland permit will also be required. In terms of the BBCP land use designation, the majority of the site is designated transitional business on the land use map, which typically includes areas along major streets and includes a mix of uses, including housing. The site also contains Park, urban and other designation and Shannon, you've got to speak up. And now we can't hear. If you're talking, we aren't hearing you at all. So can I make a suggestion as chair? If Charles or Brad could step in, um, clearly there's tech issues that we're not totally in control of, but we're here and we'd like to be able to have the hearing and I don't know how to fix the problem. And Charles, you're muted. Sorry. I'm wondering if Shannon can take the headset off and just use her laptop. I think she's using um, ear pods with a microphone, okay. which doesn't seem to be. Coming through. Try one more. <laughs> okay, Shannon. Thanks for sticking with us. We've all been there and had uh, very frustrating technical issues. So we sympathize and thank you so much for trying to help us through this. Okay, we have one more try here. Is this any better? So far, yes. Okay, let me try this one. <laughs> this is 
try number three. We'll keep going. Um, again, I apologize. Um, so let me see, where were we? Okay, we were talking about the land use designations. So it contains park, urban, and other along the multi-use path in Boulder Creek, which is intended for a variety of recreation purposes and flood control purposes. The areas south of the creek are designated high density residential. The overall project site is zoned BT1, which is a transitional business area that generally buffers a residential area from a major street and allows for a mix of uses, including residential. The project site is located at the southern edge of the Beaver Valley Recreational Center. Shannon, 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 speak into the microphone, please. Yeah, it's about it's about a half inch from my face. I'm not okay. sure. <laughs> Get it much closer. Um, let me see here. Um, the BVRC is defined in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan as a high intensity regional commercial center planned for a variety of uses. The redevelopment of the site is subject to the BVRC design guidelines and the transportation connections plan for the BVRC. There are also several plans that address the Boulder Creek Corridor, including the Greenways Master Plan and the Boulder Creek Restoration Master Plan. The site's highly accessible to transportation facilities, daily destinations, and transit. The site's well connected for bicyclists and pedestrians, including several multi use paths and on street bike lanes near or adjacent to the site. The Boulder Creek Path multi use, the Boulder Creek multi use path runs through the site, and a multi use path runs north south along 28th Street that will remain. The site is served by public transit. Several transit stops are located along Arapahoe Avenue and Folsom Street, including service on the jump route between or along Arapahoe between downtown and Lafayette and Erie and the hop route along Folsom, which provides service to the CU main campus downtown and 29th Street. The site is subject to the BVRC Transportation Connections Plan that includes planned connections through the site. It's intended to create smaller block sizes with a fine-grained transportation network and serve all travel modes. The proposal implements several of the plan connections and requests one amendment that will be discussed under key issue number four. Moving to the specific proposal tonight, here again is the image of the existing conditions on the site. And moving to the proposed site plan, this proposal includes 303 dwelling units designed for the city's university student population including amenities like a club room, fitness center, and bike storage. The site design locates the three four-story residential buildings in the central area of the site outside the high hazard and conveyance zones. The buildings feature long arms that reach south to the creek, creating programmed internal courtyards and walkways between buildings. Parking is located on surface parking lots on the east and west sides. Two of the existing cottages south of the creek that serve the existing Dreammakers Preschool and community serving office uses would remain as would parking south of the creek. In terms of access, vehicle access will remain on 28th Street at the north end of the site. The existing east-west access drive will be improved as dedicated right-of-way known as Olson Drive, fulfilling a requirement in the um, BBRC Transportation Connections Plan. The existing multi-use path along Boulder Creek would be realigned to better align with the Creek Bridge, and two new multi-use path connections would be created north-south through the site, one at the west end and one through the center. There's an existing multi-use path on 28th that would be maintained. The proposal includes a request to modify the BBRC Transportation Connection Plan in regards to the north-south multi-use path connections that will be discussed in key issue four. The proposal includes numerous pathways and sidewalks for pedestrian access throughout the site. Shannon, we're losing you again. Yeah, I apologize. I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe my internet is, is really bad tonight. I apologize. Perhaps. Go ahead, please. <clears throat> the proposal includes open space in the form of private and public spaces. 
private space is designed primarily for residents and consists of private balconies, rooftop decks, interior courtyards with amenities, landscaping, and separated via fencing. Publicly accessible open spaces um, includes areas surrounding the creek, such as an open lawn, a soft trail along the creek edge, and an improved and stabilized creek access. A half-court basketball court, four pickleball courts, and a dog park are proposed. The existing fish observatory north of the creek would remain. The proposal includes a request for a 52% parking reduction. New parking is not permitted within the high hazard and conveyance flood zones. So parking is provided in areas where it currently exists. Parking is also not permitted underground due to floodplain constraints. In support of the proposed parking reduction, the applicant has provided a transportation demand management plan to encourage alternate modes of transportation. The TDM includes elements for both the residential uses on the site, as well as the small non-residential uses in the cottages south of the creek. The elements of the TDM plan include those listed on this slide. In terms of the building design, the proposed buildings are four stories and approximately 53 feet in height. The lowest floor is elevated to at or above the flood protection elevation. The building design is contemporary with flat roofs and upper stories are set back along the creek to create rooftop decks at the third story. Here you can see the proposed height modification involves a request for four stories and 53 feet in height, where three stories and 35 feet in height are permitted by right. The additional height and stories can be approved through a site review through the community benefit requirements. This requires that inclusionary housing in lieu fees be increased from 25% to 36% for the bonus floor area, which is the fourth floor. Here you can see massing diagrams that depict the existing versus the proposed buildings, as well as examples of surrounding buildings in the area that range from one to nine stories in height. The materials of the building respond to the very various edges of the site, including three tons of brick, treated wood, metal panel, and a continuous insulation system. There are a number of renderings and details in the plan set, and I'll let the applicant share more of those detailed items. Lastly, moving to key issues. There were four key issues identified by staff. I'll go through these briefly. For key issue one, consistency with the site review criteria, staff found the proposal is designed in a manner consistent with the site review criteria and that the proposal to add substantial additional housing units and associated improvements is on balance consistent with the goals, objectives, and recommendations of the BVCP. For key issue two, proposed modifications, staff found the proposals for an additional story and additional height were consistent with the site review criteria relating to building design and with the community benefit requirements in the code. The proposed parking reduction is supported by the applicant's parking study and TDM, which includes the methods and improvements noted on this slide and the properties in an ideal location near campus and many daily amenities and transportation opportunities that allow residents to forego car use. For key issue three, a use review is required for the proposed ground floor residential uses along a street. Attached dwelling units are allowed by right in the BT1 zoning district only if they are not located on the ground floor facing a street. The zone district anticipates residential above a first floor retail, but the significant flood restrictions on the site limit the placement of buildings and prevent the location of commercial uses close to 28th as intended by the code provision. Staff found providing ground floor residential uses would be appropriate given the context and design constraints on the site and would allow the development to serve the intended transitional function from high intensity regional commercial center to the north to the residential zones to the south and west. For key issue four, the proposed amendment to the BVRC transportation connections plan the proposal may request an amendment uh, to the plan subject to the planning board's decision. In this case, the proposal will implement many of the plan BVRC connections and improvements, including the construction of a planned east-west connection, Olson Drive, including vehicular access, sidewalks, and tree lawn, updates to the Boulder Creek path, construction of two new multi-use paths through the site, 
and maintaining the existing multi-use path connection along 28th Street. The transportation connections plan depicts one additional multi-use path connection shown in the curved dashed line that would have fronted the curved shape of the hotel building. Given the changes to the site layout and building design, this multi-use path connection is proposed to not be provided as part of the redevelopment. This proposal requires an amendment to the BVRC transportation connections plan, which the applicant's requesting. Plan amendments require a review by TAB and a decision by planning board. At its February meeting, TAB reviewed and was supportive of the request. Per the BVRC, the approving authority will consider the items listed at the bottom of this slide. Staff found the requested amendment is consistent with these, the change in the design for the hotel use for the proposed apartment. That's Shannon, the Shannon, we lost you. The last two sentences were un, unhearable. Can you repeat yourself, please? Yes, definitely. Um, so staff found that the requested amendment is consistent with the change, uh, is consistent with these items to consider. The change in the design from the existing hotel to the proposed residential apartments necessitates a change in the circulation design. The proposal also provides numerous transportation connections through the site via the other three existing and or proposed multi-use path connections provided by the project, as well as several other circulation paths planned for the site. So with that, uh, staff recommends a motion to approve the site and use review application. Happy to answer any questions the board may have. Thank you for sticking with me through the technical difficulties. Shannon, thank you for that proposed for that presentation. You may get questions asking you to repeat something, but um, we will open up now to questions. Uh, uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand. All right, if no, oh, ML, and then Laura, and Laura, did you have your hand? Whoa, okay, ML, Laura, <laughs> Mark, it's a, Kurt. It's a ML, flood. <laughs> ML, Laurel, Mark, Kurt. Go ahead, ML. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the presentation, um, Shannon. So uh, I have, uh, just starting out, the height modification, is it, there's the criteria um, up by which people can ask for a height modification. And is this one being asked for because of the topography of the site? Um, it's being asked for in order to allow for the fourth story um, of the building. So the criteria that it's allowed under, I believe, is the, the last one in the criteria list. Um, at the very end which is what if maybe you could just re read that out so because we're, we're not all able to go quickly to this the location in the code yes let me try to find that yes under 9214h2k that's where there's the additional criteria for height bonuses is located. Oh, okay. I've got BE3. That's not. Shannon, maybe you can yeah, tell us what is the criteria they request? What is the criteria yeah. they utilized for the request? I think is ML's and question. It, and then under 9214 right. e, e Three. B, yeah. Uh, B E. Excuse me. B one E. If I'm looking at the same code you're looking at, at the very bottom. Uh, <laughs> B I I I. The building. Uh, the building or use meets the requirements of the subparagraph for a height bonus. Uh, Shannon, if you're talking, we did not hear you after something that sounded like high bones, which I know is not what you said. I think she said height bonus. <laughs> height bonus. Yes. 
Yes, let me make sure I'm looking at the uh, correct code here. Can you hear me any better, any better now? Yeah. Okay, so I'm under 9214. Scope is number B, one, development review thresholds, E, height modifications. And then the last one is BIII, where it allows for a height modification. But can you read the specific one that it meets? It's got to meet one of any number of options. And the only one that looked logical to me was the topography. Um, yes, it's this. Uh, let me see if I can just pull this over on my screen. Oh, that would be excellent. I think it's just the one about community benefit, that if they offer us the community benefit, they can request the height modification. If I'm not mistaken, they don't have to. They don't have to have a logistical reason why they have to have it. E three, height yeah. modification is allowed. Height modification is is allowed up to greater two stories or the maximum number of stories permitted in a building, and that because of the topography of the site. So I thought it was three, but you're saying it's not. It's four. Height bonus which is what Laura is saying? Yes, it's the one referring to a height bonus. It's a little it's a little confusing because we've modified the code so many times, but right. it would be the one regarding a height bonus. Okay, yeah. so if it's, so do we know how many, it would be for all of the fourth floor. How much did that add to the inclusionary housing? Do we know what, what we gained, what we would gain? How much, how much the fees would be for inclusionary housing? So without the without the height uh, bonus versus with the height bonus, how much how much are we gaining? Do we know? So are you able to hear me right now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So with the height with the inclusionary housing fees, the total amount of fees that would be provided for inclusionary housing by this project would be about eighteen point nine million based on our current fees. And we don't know which, how much of that is due to the fourth floor? Um, I don't have that information at my fingertips. Um, okay. I, I could try to check through my emails and see if I can find that. Yeah, and there's a um, discussion of this ML on page 18 of the packet under proposed height modification where it talks about um, all residential projects being subject to providing at least 25% of the units permanently affordable or the in lieu fee or another another equivalent, in which case um, the percentage uh, jumps up in this project from 25 to 36%. So the number of units considered bonus units is the number that's the percentage of all units of the building that equals in number the percentage of bonus floor area in the building. Right, right. So that'd be the fourth floor. Uh, is that correct? It's the fourth floor. Um, okay. Um, uh, that, that was my primary question. I've got a whole bunch of others, but I'll let other people ask their questions. Thank you. Okay, so Lee, Laura was next, then Mark, then Kurt. You know, I've got a bunch, Sarah, so I'm fine for Mark and Kurt to go ahead and knock a few out before I get to mine. Okay, Mark and then Kurt. Sure. Um, just in uh, response to ML, if <laughs> if we have 25% inclusionary housing for the first three floors and 36 for the fourth floor, then a rough math calculation would say that of the 18.9 million, I'm going to say a little less than 40% would come from the fourth floor and about 60% would come from the first three floors. But that's just math in my head, and I've been known to be way wrong on that. Um, okay, <laughs> my questions for staff are first, uh, our greenway system, the management of that is very complex in the sense of it's administered by this mix of parks and rec, uh, transportation, OSMP, um, there's a lot of people involved and, and in some regards, no one is, is really in charge. And that's something I've 
noticed as being part of the Greenways Committee for a couple of years. My question is, uh, how is staff addressing the um, maintenance, programming, uh, who's responsible for what in, re in, in regard to everything from the center line of the creek back to, to what point? And, uh, and is this clear in your uh, discussions and agreements with the applicant as to who is exactly responsible for what? And even to the point I, I was reading in their management agreement, they say, well, we will we will we plan to maintain the creek and stuff, but gee, we might have to close certain areas after certain hours. And again, uh, we have this mixing of private property and public property in a very complex situation. And I'd just like you to address how that's been addressed with the applicant and what that understanding is. Yeah, so the the conversations have been pretty extensive with the applicant. Um, they've involved uh, staff from various departments, including parks, OSMP, uh, transportation, uh, forestry, trying to think who else. But virtually every department that can be involved has reviewed this proposal and provided feedback um, specifically on the question that you've raised um, about the maintenance of the area. Um, this is a private property, so there is no uh, city maintenance of the creek, um, of anything of that sort. It is, it's a private property. Um, the only maintenance that the city would do would be plowing the multi-use path as we do for all multi-use paths. So it's a private property. There are areas that are intended for public use and those are being uh, proposed through this proposal to enhance the creek corridor and, and provide those amenities to the public. Um, but again, it's, it's not something that the city is taking on any maintenance responsibilities uh, of that area. Wow, okay. I mean, I, I understand this private property. I always had somehow, and again, my bad for making any assumptions that that there was some city uh, control from from center of the creek or from the stream bank x number of feet in. So you're saying that's not the case. So in terms of let's just say herbicides, pesticides, uh, plantings of they decide gee they like a particular they like Russian olives along the creek bank. The city doesn't have a uh, have an, uh, an authority or a control over over that area. Well, we have um, a trans we have a trail and recreation easement that covers the multi use path in the creek. Sorry, you probably can't hear me. We I'm, I'm, I'm waiting in. <laughs> <laughs> we have a trail and uh, recreation easement that covers the multi-use path and the area along the creek um, that provides basically for public access in that area. Um, this proposal will also dedicate additional public access easements and the proposal would approve um, the landscaping plan that's being proposed. So changes to that would be reviewed by staff um, if such a change were proposed. I don't, um, I don't have any indication that a proposal for Russian olives would be, <laughs> would be a change that would be proposed. I, I, yeah, I, I was again, an exaggerated example. Okay, my follow-on question, which has now changed a little bit, is, and, and during the DAB meeting, and I was present for that design advisory board meeting and I brought it up then and I read the applicant's response to uh, DAB, specifically my concern, that the multi-use path as it's being proposed uh, dips to the north quite a bit into the property off of its current alignment. And so it, it goes into the property quite a bit close to the buildings. And there's a perception I think by people that, okay, 
on one side of that multi-use path, that's them. And on the other side, south of the multi-use path, that, that, that it, the perception could be that that is public space. And you're saying that that is not, that that is private space. So I, I, I get concerned with, with two things. One, this is a commuting corridor for a lot of people. They ride their bike back and forth to work uh, for shopping, et cetera. And there is, um, uh, so the perception is, okay, you've got me kind of winding around out of my way a little bit off of what the current alignment is. But more importantly, um, I, I just want it to be clear that this is a 24 seven, that the path itself is 24 seven, that, that the property owners can't decide yeah, we we really don't like this. I mean, I, I just want to make sure that our easements, there have been hi historical instances where easements have been agreed to and subsequently, uh, you know, disputes rise up and it's like, well, I didn't agree to that. I, I'm, I, okay, I'm, I'm mumbling around. My, I have real concerns about this public-private space, alignment of the path, and the public's perception of where they can go and where they can't go. And so uh, could you elaborate on any discussions you've had with the applicant and, and why they kind of keep wanting to keep that path pushed far to the north? Yes, um, in terms of the alignment of the path, my understanding is that that is intended to better align with the alignment of the bridge so that it you don't have that quick turn when you're going across the bridge, how it is now. So that was the design intent behind the curve. Um, staff was generally supportive of that change to make that alignment more of a curve and less of a sharp turn. Um, that, that would be my response to that. In terms of the design of the spaces, I think, um, I think it's pretty. It's as it's clear to me in the in the proposal that the intent is for the bulk of this space to be a publicly accessible space. Um, the city can't compel the property owner to dedicate that space to the city necessarily. Um, that would probably be beyond um, a reasonable ask. But I think the proposal is pretty clear what spaces are intended to be public. And there are spaces that are intended to be private that are fenced in the courtyard areas. And obviously private balconies, private um, rooftop decks, things of that nature. Um, in terms of access, you know, through the site on the multi-use paths, um, those will be dedicated easements. Um, there's an exhibit, I believe in the civil plan set that depicts all of those easements that will be dedicated over all of those paths. So those will continue to be accessible in, in perpetuity. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be done here in just a second. So I'll, I just wanna read uh, page 119 of 5B part two. The goal of these programmatic elements are to provide a combination of both active and passive recreation opportunities for the community as a whole. Some areas will be available for community use from dawn to dusk. Uh, and so you know, that kind of caveat, and I understand you, you, you have security concerns and everything else. I just, uh, I, I'm super concerned uh, and just want staff to take note that um, it would be, to me, unacceptable to have uh, historically public access areas uh, be restricted uh, from uh, dusk until dawn or unavailable dusk until dawn if they are historically used. So I'm just going to express that as a concern, and uh, maybe the applicant can can speak to that um, uh, during their presentation. Okay. Hey, thanks, Mark. Um, Kurt, then Laura, then Lisa. Okay, well, my first question is exactly along the lines of where Mark was going. So Olson Drive 
is shown on the BVRC connections plan, right? As a street. And that half of that is being dedicated. The land is actually being dedicated to the city, right? In a fee simple transfer or whatever the right term is. Is that correct? Because we have a transportation connections plan that outlines specific right of way dedications, um, we can request or, or require those dedications as part of a redevelopment of the property. Yes. I see. Okay. And so the obviously the question is why is the creek path or the other paths not treated the same? And it's because they are not identified as right of way dedications in the BVRC connections plan. There will be dedications um, of easements over the pass. That would be the typical dedication we would require for a multi-use path. We would not typically request a right-of-way dedication for a multi-use path. But, okay, but why? I mean, maybe that's historic precedence, but the I, I would bet you anything that the creek path gets more traffic than Olson Drive will get. So why the difference in treatment? Yeah, that's I I'm I would probably have to defer to legal staff as to the difference in the dedications that we typically get uh, right of way versus an easement. In my mind, they're equivalent in terms of securing public access to to a space. Right. Sorry, this is uh, Laura Witt from the city attorney's office. The main um, difference there with the right of way versus an easement is the maintenance, right? It is taking care of the underlying ground and support. When it's a right of way easement, then our transportation department does take on more of the responsibilities of maintaining that road and it has more transportation um, ties to it. Uh, so that's kind of why we do that. Um, there's also, so we snow plow that area. But then we also, for the multi-use path, but we also require that they maintain, you know, the area around it, keep it clear. That's part of our easements is that we have the landowner actually do a lot of the work, whereas right away is a little bit more onus on the city to make sure that that space is cleared out. There's a little bit more work from staff, from transportation staff. So that's why transportation staff will identify certain areas to be right of way versus um, this easement. So there's kind of a separation there. Um, I'm not as familiar with the exact details of what those look like, but that's the general uh, reason as to why they're a little bit different. Okay, well, I guess the question remains, why, why are we treating Olson Drive and the Creek Path differently? It seems like, one, we want to take on the, the right-of-way responsibilities, and one, we don't. And it's not clear to me why. So I don't know if anybody can clear that up. Yeah, I guess I would say that that's been the policy of the city is that improvements um, such as a multi-use path are, are under a dedicated public access easement. Um, I don't know of any that I can think of that are in a right of way. Um, the the public access to both of those are are guaranteed um, either way. Um, I think it's in as Laurel mentioned, the maintenance responsibilities um, are slightly different. Um, so that that would be the best answer I have at this time. Okay, um, I'll just uh, continue about a couple more transportation things if I can, and then I'll pass it off. Um, the, what is, do we know what the cross section for Olson Drive will look like? I assume we do because we know how much right away we're asking for, right? Yes, there are um, a cross section provided in the civil plans. So vehicular access is one, uh, each one vehicle each way, 20 foot in width an eight foot tree lawn and an eight foot sidewalk along there to be provided by this project. Okay, 
So, so the full curb, curb face to curb face width will be 40 feet well, after when it's completed. I, I can't say that I know for sure. There may be some shuffling around um, in the meantime, but that was being proposed by this project is the 20 foot of the vehicle access, the tree lawn and the sidewalk that would be constructed with this project. Okay, so is this is this cross section specified anywhere, or is this just sort of a general concept that we have? Um, in the BVRC connections plan, it's described as a secondary access. Um, so that's that was the the design that was determined was based on the BVRC. Uh, transportation plan and what it was asking for. Okay, but we don't have any more specifics than that at this point. Um, no. Okay. And so one more question then about that. Um, so as I understood from the memo, for the time being, we'll only have the south section of of Olson Drive, right? And so will be using one travel lane plus what will eventually be the parking lane as the two travel lanes. Is that correct? That's my understanding. Um, the applicant has their transportation folks here and could probably go into a little bit more depth as to how the design uh, was designed. Okay, so, okay. So but I guess my question then is, I, I saw on the plans that there will be a bulb out at the intersection of Olson Drive and 28, which then would interfere, it seems like, with the use of that eastbound parking lane as a travel lane. And so I'm trying to understand how that would work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this this design um, in particular at the north end of the property, um, this area has historically been used as an informal access road um, in coordination with the property to the north. Um, there is a, as part of the approval, the applicant will be dedicating um, an easement that will uh, involve that property owner to the north um, that will um, allow for continued public access along the portion of the property to the north that's being used informally over the decades for people to drive through there. Um, so that would um, accommodate, I think, the jog in the alignment that you're referring to. Okay, uh, that sounds... Odd. I think the transportation engineer would not be keen on that because it's a very sudden job. But would would this be a question that would be better put to the applicant? They they may know which job specifically you're referring to. I not I I may not be visualizing the correct spot. Um, oh. So they, okay. yeah, know exactly what you're referring to. Okay. I can hold off on that. Um, all right, sorry, one more transportation related question. Um, so what's being proposed is two accesses to the east parking area, right? One off Olson Drive and one directly off 28. It's specified, I think in the DCS, although it might be in the code, that access is to be off the lowest classification street, which in this case would be Olson Drive. So the question is, why are we, why, well, does our code allow then for maintaining that access directly off 28? And wouldn't it be more consistent with the DCS and the code to only allow off access off of Olson Drive? Yeah, the code does allow for variations to that requirement. 
Um, my understanding is that the access point at Olson Drive is exclusively a right in, right out. So without the southern access point, there would be no left into this site from 28. Um, I would probably defer to the applicant's transportation folks to share a little bit more about the transportation design and how they expect folks to best access the site. Okay, thank you. Okay, Kurt, thank you. We'll, we'll do another roundabout. Um, so Laura's next, and if I might ask Laura, since you already forewarned us, you have a lot of questions. Could you maybe ask a few and then we'll go to Lisa and then to ML and then come back around? Yes, um, and Sarah, feel free to cut me off at any time. I welcome that <laughs> if I'm going too long. So my first question was very much um, in alignment with what ML was talking about. It would be really useful in the future if we have not just the formula for calculating bonus units, but how many actual bonus units did we get in affordable housing if we grant this fourth story height modification. Good decisions are based on good data. And right now we know that it's a, a bump from 25% to 36%, but we don't know what that means in terms of number of units or number of dollars into the affordable housing program. And that if I'm understanding correctly, so here's a question, um, that fourth floor is cut away on all of the arms facing the creek, right? Like there's a, a section of that fourth floor that is missing on all three buildings on every arm facing the creek. Is, do I have that right? It only goes up to three stories in those areas. My understanding is the design intent of that step back is to allow for the buildings to be perceived as not as tall from the Boulder Creek corridor and to allow for those rooftop decks. Um, so, yes. 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 And then to achieve those purposes, which I think we all would say that's good. We want to break up the massing and have it not be quite as imposing from the creek, have it be shorter in some areas. But those those arms where they butt up against the creek path or where they face the creek path are three stories rather than four, right? So there's no additional height bonus being requested in, in those areas, right? Those are rooftop decks, not additional units. Yeah, so the height bonus, um, I could look at the exact language. There's a certain way that it's calculated. And so I would have to double check on on that, the intent of how it is calculated is to avoid a scenario where a design is is intentionally designed in such a way to like reduce the amount of fees. Um, so I could try to look at that language to see if that might be helpful. Yeah, no, I'm not I'm not concerned about that. I, I think that's that's fine. That I don't think that they're trying to do fee avoidance. I think that there are good reasons for that step back that we that this board would very likely support. I was just pointing out that there's not as much fourth floor as every other floor. Um, so in trying to calculate how many additional units are up there and therefore calculate the um, affordable housing percentage, it would be useful for us if staff did that calculation rather than us trying to do that calculation according to the formulas. So that was my first question about the um, affordable housing community benefit provision. Um, I, 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 it sounds like Shannon, you don't have that number at your fingertips right now. I'm not, not mad about it, but in the future for staff in general, it would be good to have that calculation done so that we know how many bonus units did we get if we grant this height modification or what that's worth in terms of affordable housing fees. Um, like ML said, what's the differential between having a fourth floor or not having a fourth floor. Um, second question, I wanted to know um, whether a previous comment was uh, resolved and that was uh, parks and rec staff had had some questions about the fish observatory and what that would look like. And I want to know whether parks and rec staff were satisfied with the plan for the fish observatory or if they had uh, continuing questions or concerns. Um, the Parks and Rec staff were satisfied with the discussion regarding the fish observatory. Um, so the, the proposal to maintain that was, was supported by Parks and Rec staff. Okay. And has the fish observatory's relationship to the main path, has that changed with the redesign of the main path? It looked to me like the fish observatory is now kind of off of the main path. And I don't recall whether it's always been that way or whether um, 
this is a change. So in this image here, this would be the fish observatory and then moving to the proposed image, it's located here. Okay, so people can still find it. People will still know where it is. Okay, all right, yeah. thank you. Um, another comment by OSMP staff, they talked about being not supportive of having concrete steps leading to the creek and wanting the applicant to use natural materials such as boulders and cobble. Was that resolved? Yes, that's my understanding that all of the comments um, previously provided have been resolved. Okay. How? Oh, how was it resolved? Yeah, my under yeah my understanding is that there was a discussion between the applicant and OSNP staff regarding that design change. Um, I don't know the exact outcome of what that conversation led to. Um, the applicant could probably describe how the design was updated based on that comment. Okay, I'll ask them if they're using natural materials such as boulder and cobble, and if that was the resolution. Thank you for that. Um, Tab made a comment about the three buildings and suggesting that they be kind of distinct from each other so that each building has more of its own visual identity rather than just kind of blending in to each other. And what happened with that comment, or if you're aware? Because it looks to me like the buildings all look pretty similar. There's not like a, here's what building one looks like, here's what building two looks like. You said Dab made that comment? Did you say Dab or? I said Tab, was, but I think you're right that it was Dab. It was not Tab. It was Dab. It was Dab, sorry, my mistake. Okay. Yeah, um, I think there was an attachment in the packet that provides um, a pretty detailed conversation of how the applicant attempted to um, address Dab's comments. I think that part of the proposal um, in this case uh, in the design intent um, was that there was different materials on different edges of the building. Um, so I think the applicant, um, if I recall correctly, on the back of the building provided more variation in the materials um, in terms of different types of metal and also tried to, to provide, um, I believe, some different variations on different edges of the building in response to that comment, if I'm if I'm recalling correctly. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I do recall seeing a lot of um, uh, adaptations made in response to Dab's comments, but I wasn't quite sure about that one. So I'll ask the applicant that one. I can pass at this point and come back, although I don't know if Brad, Brad's hand came up. So I don't know if that was in response to something that I just asked if Brad wanted to jump in. It, it is, and, and I don't want this to come across as, as trying to uh, discourage any of the conversation, but I will note that we have not yet let the applicant do their presentation, and, and some of these questions might be answered through that and or in questions to them, uh, just trying to balance out the overall conversation for the evening, and, and also a reminder that after uh, public hearing, additional questions can be asked of staff, so just, just giving that perspective. Uh, we know they've got a lot to offer. It's a good point, Brad. I'll yield at this point. Hey, um, so ML, Lisa has gone dark for a moment. So ML, you're next. And then Kurt, is your hand still up or is that? Okay, so it'll be ML and Lisa when she comes back and then I have a couple of questions. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I, I just have uh, one more question. This is regard to um, the ground floor residential. And again, there are criteria for, for rationale on that ground floor residential. Can you tell me which of the, of the four criteria this project, it wasn't apparent to me which one that they were using to claim um, the ground floor residential. So that would be yes. plan dash two dash fifteen E. Yes. Are you asking about under rationale? Yes, I am. Yes. Um, the one that staff uh, found that they fulfilled was providing a compatible transition between 
higher intensity and lower intensity uses. Um, that was V in attachment D to the memo. Great. I couldn't, I, it was a huge packet. I didn't find that, but thank you for answering the question. That, that's it. That's my only question just now. Thanks. All right. Thank you, ML. Um, I have some simple questions. Uh, what agency has to provide the wetlands permit? The city. The city. So, and the city, according to, if I read the material correctly, the city's already approved that, or there's some other step that has to happen? So, there's both a floodplain uh, permit, mm -hmm. and that one was approved, <clears throat> excuse me, in May uh, for the for the changes that are associated with this site review. There's also a wetland permit specific to the wetlands, and that one would most likely be reviewed concurrent with the tech doc review by the city. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm gonna follow up. Uh, sorry, I'm taking notes while, while I'm trying to ask a question. Just a follow up to the questions uh, that Mark and Kurt asked, why, why the huge shift in the in the shape of the um, I mean in the shape of the creek path? I mean I understand I know I know that corner very well. It is a pretty sharp corner, but the the change that's been proposed creates a, a ripple effect of other issues. So I'm curious why the uh, big shift in the um, shape of the or the curve of the um, Pat Creek path this could this project go forward without that? Keep the right, keep the existing creek path. Um, that was my understanding of uh, what was described before was that it was intended to align more with the bridge. Um, so I would ask the applicant to explain more about the exact curve and how they came to that design. Okay. Um, and then this is the question that. Uh, because I'm a member of the tennis uh, com tennis business, I'm just sort of curious. Or tennis club, Rocky Mountain Tennis Club. One of the question, one of the uh, Boulder Valley Comp Plan goals is about the city nurturing and supporting and minimizing displacement of businesses. And I'm just curious what the city, which is 5.05 BCVP BVCP. I'm just sort of curious to understand what has the city done to be helpful to Rocky Mountain Tennis Center, which serves wheelchair athletes and low-income kids uh, to um, find a new home or keep the business in the city. I'm just sort of curious what the city has done about that, if anything. So I have not been involved in any of the conversations specifically with the tennis club. Um, there may have been other staff that were. Um, I know the applicant for sure has been um, so I don't have any specific information on, on that issue. Um, so I just have not been involved um, in those conversations. Okay, but as the person managing the process, you have no records of the city doing anything. Um, when the project was assigned to me, um, that was not, I was not made aware of anything as part of the development review process. Um, that's happening with that. There may be other city departments and folks that are involved with that, um, but I'm I, not as part of the development review um, arm of the, of the project. Okay. okay. Um, all right. Now let me just see if Lisa is Lisa. Are you back by any chance, Lisa Smith? Did you? No question. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, Laura, if you have a couple more questions that are appropriate for staff versus maybe uh, the applicants. Okay. Yeah, just a couple more. Thank you. Um, the, it, and I maybe could ask this later, but related to the TDM plan, um, eco passes are and I understand that most students get an eco pass with their um, uh, being a student, but the eco pass is are only required for three years. I think I think it said three years. Is that typical? Um, is that does the city usually do that? Why why isn't it an ongoing thing that they would provide eco passes as part of having a development that is trying to discourage car dependent living? And given that the population is going to keep turning over, why is it only three years? 
Yes, that's the city standard condition is the three years. Um, the intent behind that is that the city is able to have the developer start the process and start having folks use their eco passes, find out about the transportation options. The city places those funds in escrow and manages those funds. Um, so it's not our intent to do that in perpetuity for every project to manage those funds forever. Um, it's really intended to more kind of jumpstart, get folks involved in that. And um, with, the, with the hope that there would be um, that d demand uh, from, uh, from the residents that they want to continue using that and kind of an expectation that that'll be provided in the future. Okay, thank you. And just one more. Um, I see that staff originally had some comments about the fencing and I'll talk to the applicant about that. But one of the things it says is that a request to include a fence height greater than seven feet would need to be included as a modification request through site review. So I'm assuming that the fence height has been taken down to seven feet or less. Is that correct? Yes, at one point there were some renderings that appear to depict rather tall fences at the edges of the courtyards. Um, those fences have now been better detailed and they're a maximum of five feet high. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. That's the end for me. Okay, Mark, um, a question for staff. Yes, and it's just a follow on to Laura's and I was going to talk to the applicant about this, but I think it's an appropriate time to talk to staff about this. The three-year EcoPass term, and I have lots of other problems with this, but the three-year EcoPass term that keeps being bandied about, um, that is not, as I understand it, that's really not in the code. That's in the 2011 draft TDM toolkit, which keeps being revived from uh, its grave. And it, so am I wrong in that, in that, that it's a, uh, it's a remnant from a draft plan that was never adopted, or is three years some unwritten thing, or is it written and I just don't know where it is? Um, I would, I, I can't speak to the, the plan you're referring to specifically, but since I've been at the city, it's been the policy to require a three-year timeline for eco passes for the reasons I described okay. and that it kind of gets them started with it, but that we don't manage it forever. One of those policies that, as far as you know, it's like tribal knowledge, but it's not in the code. Not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. All right, um, any last questions? Let's remember that some of this is for our discussion later. Uh, okay. Thank you, Shannon. Don't go away. Uh, I'm sure we'll have additional questions, but now it's time for the applicant. Um, you will have 15 minutes to present. And uh, I don't know who's leading the applicant pool. I'm going to assume it's Danica. Hi there. Yes, um, I'm here. Um, we need a few more people promoted. I think is Kaylin from yeah, Wink. I'm here. There. Okay. Yep. So thank you so much. Um, I also can't share my screen. Oh, so the okay. So Amy to would need to share her screen. And I'm trying to see if anyone else needs to get promoted. We got Cody. All right, thank you so much. Um, this is a huge project. We love hearing all of your discussion and questions so far. I am Danica Powell with Trestle Strategy Group. I've been working on this project for about four years and I'm, this is a big moment for us to be able to present it to you again tonight and get your feedback, questions, and hopefully move forward. Um, next slide. I wanted to say thank you for Shannon to Shannon for stepping in as our case manager. Um, as you know, there's been a lot of staff turnover at the city, and um, Shannon stepped in a few months ago to really help land this plane, and she's provided excellent coordination. We've had a lot of city departments involved in this project, Parks and Rec, Open Space Mountain Parks, Urban Drainage, Flood, um, 
planning and development, et cetera. And so I'm, I'm, it's unfortunate that they're not all here tonight, but I, we hope that we can answer all the questions that you brought up earlier in the this evening. Um, it is a very complex project. It's a large site, over 15 acres. It's a significant opportunity and we take that very seriously. So we hope that we can continue to answer your questions. Um, the previous slide was our team and we've got a big one. We're all here. Some of us are on the um, promoted and some of us aren't, but we will be ready to answer your questions, including the developer landmark properties. Thank you, next slide. So quickly, this is our overview of our presentation. We know we only have 15 minutes, so we'll do go as fast as we can. We've limited our presenters to three people so that we can be efficient. And hopefully you will continue to ask us a lot of the questions that you have had earlier this evening. Next slide. So in terms of entitlement, we came for concept in November of 2021. We have subsequently gone through six reviews with the city staff and multiple iterations and rounds of reviews with all those departments I spoke of. We have submitted our CLOMAR, which is a condi conditional letter of map revision for the floodplain changes that are needed to create this um, a building site and have it be flood protected because currently the building and site are not flood protected. And then we are planning to go into tech talks and construction later next year. Next slide. So what was important to us is to go back and review what was important to you when we came back in 2021. Um, one of the big questions was how is Boulder Creek activated and improved? So we've really worked on differentiating the public space, which there are easements and maintenance agreements and lots of um, things to determine how all of this open space, 52% will be maintained, as well as what's private, because it's also important the site review criteria that the people that live here have their own space. We've worked very hard on our transportation demand management plan and parking reduction to really prove up how this parking reduction will work and what we can do to support that with the people living here in the future. Uh, solar and sustainability was identified as very important. Retaining existing businesses was also identified as very important to this um, planning board and then working with DAB and TAB as we moved through the process. Next slide. So in terms of outreach and engagement, we've done a lot of that over the last three years, working with neighbors, their main concern was parking. We've worked with the existing businesses, including um, the daycare center, uh, Simba and the Lake Eldora racing team. And so they are invited to retain, be retained on site. We've been working with Rocky Mountain Tennis Center to focus on a transition plan because of the complexity with the the bubble that is in the floodplain, and we can get into that in questions if you have them. Um, we've worked with our neighbor um, Regency on access and creating this Olson Drive. We've worked with CU Boulder to talk about tennis, transportation, housing, and many city departments, as I mentioned. Next slide. Um, our TDM is of high importance because of the parking reduction and the proximity to the university. We are charging for parking. We are providing an alternative transportation fund for folks that don't bring a vehicle to help them buy into other um, ways of getting around. Eco passes, uh, the, the student population at CU does get eco passes. So we are providing those for anybody who doesn't have one. Um, creating a lot of infrastructure improvements to the Boulder Creek path, the multi-use path and safety improvements. And we have exceeded our parking um, and bike parking requirements by a, a lot um, to provide extra bike parking, both outdoor and indoor, short and long term. And we want to create a lot of marketing materials. Our goal is to help people understand that they don't need a car when they get here and how to get around. Next slide. Um, we did take a trip to the transfer, Transportation Advisory Board and talked to them about 
specifically about com combining a multi-use path um, alignment through the center of our site. The old transportation master plan had the multi-use path around the hotel. And so with our new site plan, we needed to adjust that and get an amendment to bring it through our site and connect to Boulder Creek Path. We also are aligning Boulder Creek Path to create a, a more safe and accessible bike experience, as well as a separated pedestrian experience. And I think you have a lot of questions about that. So we'll wait for you to ask them of us. Um, TAB did support our um, TDM and transportation master plan amendments. Next slide. And I'll pass so, it off to Amy with um, Shears Atkins Rod Rockmore, who is our architect, to do a fly through of the project site. Thanks, Danica. So we have a fly through animation that we'll share with you just to walk through some of the um, highlights of the changes that we've made to the design. Um, and I'll, before I start, I just want to call attention to the key plan that we'll have in the bottom right to help orient. We have the red chevron to show where the, the view clips will be taken from. So we're starting off on the um, northeast side from the intersection of 28th and Olson. This is the easternmost building where we have the main entry and the leasing area. The main amenity spaces are in this building. The multi-use path connecting north-south across the site. We've intentionally designed curves along this path to help reduce the speed of cyclists. How this connects to the public park on the south end. We have this buffered rain garden between the public park and the more private courtyards. crossing over that rain garden area through the pedestrian mew. We've worked with city staff in response to DAB, adding these corner balcony units, help, helping to emphasize circulation through the site, adding the north entries on the north side, having a corner balcony and creating this welcoming beacon on the northwest corner. And then also developing the south side of the site with more public programmed space. It was just a, a, a little teaser of the, the recent edits that we've made to the, the project um, to really create more of a public amenity. Jump back over to our slides. Let Kaylin jump in. Thanks, Amy. Kaylin Crozier with Wink Associates, our landscape architect on the project. Um, you could see that that those were just pieces and scenes across the site. This is a very large site, less than just under 16 acres in size. Um, there were obviously many questions already about the, the site that I'll, I'll try to touch on briefly through this presentation, but we can circle back to more questions during Q&A. Um, you can see that a lot of the site is open space and landscape area with Boulder Creek um, crossing through the bottom third of the project area. Um, a key component of this design is to create a destination along Boulder Creek Path um, that is publicly accessible, similar, similar to the Civic Center area in Boulder that exists. Um, and the, the key framework for creating this program and this structure is the peeling away of the, of the Boulder Creek path from the existing alignment along the edge of the creek. Um, there have been a lot of questions already on this alignment. Um, it, it is for safety reasons, primarily because there is a blind corner on both sides of the bridge that exists today. Um, so the real realignment creates a much safer connection for pedestrian and cyclists on both sides. In addition, creates a better connection for transportation um, and overall improves circulation and staff has been supportive of these changes. 
Um, I'll speak a little bit more to that as we continue on, but uh, we've also worked closely with staff on landscape materiality and creating a sense of place and um, wayfinding throughout the site that is very intuitive through materials. Next slide. Um, as mentioned, over half of the site is usable open space, much of which is publicly accessible as highlighted in yellow in the upper left hand corner of the screen. Um, we can kind of touch on this more, but there will also be private resident courtyards as shown in orange on the screen as well, which on the south side will be um, fenced with key to access which is the view that you will be looking at on the right hand side of your screen. Um, we've also provided a very generous buffer of landscape rain garden vegetated area between the public and private spaces to delineate the, the difference in space and transition between these two areas. Next slide. Um, this is an enlargement of the north side of the open space area. Uh, you can see here we're pulling away that Boulder Creek path uh, clearly identifies program space. Um, so we are creating about a half acre open lawn area in the center of the site, which is allowed by the peeling away of this pathway. Um, it also separates cyclists and pedestrian traffic, creating a much nicer pedestrian edge along the creek side. Um, there were questions about the creek access. We have removed any concrete tear thing along the creek edge and replaced with natural stone at a much smaller scale. Um, so the natural elements are brought into the creek corridor, especially within the wetland buffer. Um, the lawn area was designed around the existing honey locust trees kind of in the middle of that lawn area. Um, that's a key feature for us. We worked highly with staff um, on prioritizing those trees and preserving uh, preservation of those trees as well. Um, and that will come into play as far as I know there were questions on the alignment of the Boulder Creek path, but the elevation and location of those trees that we were able to preserve is a key component as to the limitations we have on the alignment of that path and how close or far it can be from the creek. Um, additionally, you see the fish observatory that we have maintained. Uh, we also worked closely with staff to improve the connection between the multi-use path and Boulder Creek path where those two intersect for safer circulation uh, through the site. Next slide. And on the south side of the creek, we've added new programming. So the last time this project was here, um, this programming did not exist. And you can see where the Boulder Creek path continues to be aligned in an improved access and connects to the existing pedestrian underpass at 28th Street on the bottom right hand side of the corner. Um, there were a few questions already on programming. You can see here that we are creating publicly accessible program space including active lawn, dog park, and pickleball. The intention is for all of the Boulder Creek path and public areas to be accessible. Uh, there will be certain limitations in use, especially for areas like the dog park and pickleball for timing, which are in line with typical city standard maintenance hours and operations for parks. Um, so that will be due to safety concerns, but this will be a, a really great public amenity. Next slide. Um, the greatest challenge that we had on site, or one of the greatest challenges is grading and floodplain requirements. Um, the buildings will need to be elevated several feet higher than the existing building elevation today in order to be constructed at the flood protection elevation. Um, so essentially the entire center of the site is going to be raised. Um, that really uh, constricted us in existing mature trees that we could preserve on site. We worked closely with staff to identify site review criteria and methods to meet this. Uh, we worked over the course of several months to understand implications. We uh, provided an updated arborist report as well as uh, created a very thorough study of existing trees on site. 
The trees shown in light green are existing to be preserved. You can see the ones in the lawn that I previously mentioned, as well as other trees primarily along the Boulder Creek. Um, we're preserving 171 healthy trees. The trees in darker green are proposed new trees to be added. About four, 440 trees we are adding, including a succession understory planting along the Boulder Creek for future uh, tree canopy establishment. So overall, we are replacing trees at greater than a three to one ratio on site. Next slide. Thanks, Kaylin. Um, so we have um, some slides looking at the design advisory board. So most of the comments were focused on the north elevation. Um, and you can see the um, the comments from from DAB were wanting us to increase uh, the design caliber and really increase the some visual interest and having refined detail along this north elevation. So the previous elevation, um, in comparison, we were able to introduce corner corner balconies. Um, we have um, introduced two different tones and profiles of metal panel um, to help introduce um, some variation on the, the north elevation and then also developing the, the landscaping to um, communicate this entry portal um, into the pedestrian mew. We were able to add entries onto the north elevation. So a primary comment from DAB was looking at um, being able to activate Olson Drive and really treat it as the future street like it is intended to be. Um, so adding the entries not only programmatically activates Olson Drive, but it also brings um, some material variation, as you can see in the elevation, um, being, being recessed um, and clad in wood. And then the northwest corner was also um, discussed in DAB as um, being a focal point for the entry from Folsom. Folsom. And um, so we, we were able to do a couple of things. So um, we previously had services and a waste room on that corner. Um, and so we were able to reprogram the corner and relocate the waste room and the associated overhead door. We were able to relocate the transformers and um, electrical service equipment um, to the south side of the site where we'll have it fenced. Um, and we were, um, because we were able to relocate the, um, the services, we're able to have these wraparound balconies to really um, create this this welcoming corner beacon um, on on the northwest corner of the site. Well, thank you, Amy and Kaylin. We had a lot to get through in a very short amount of time, and we look forward to your questions. Like I said, we have a huge team here to answer everything from engineering to transportation to parking. Our goal over the last several years is to really um, identify, like really identify what the site needs. One of the first things we did is documented the social history. There's a lot that happened here that was very impressive and incredible. Scott Carpenter came here after he went to the out to outer space. Um, so we have that documented at Carnegie Library. We have really integrated a lot of solar throughout the site on the roof. We cannot do it in the parking lots because of the floodplain. Um, we have added stormwater management and water quality to protect the watershed where it doesn't exist today. And permeability is actually increased with this project. We are decreasing the amount of buildings and pavement that are there today. We're also increasing the tree canopy and the heat island effect or reducing the heat island effect. Housing near campus provides, um, reduces vehicle miles traveled. It also um, relinquishes the impact on single family housing in some of the neighborhoods like Hill Hotel or Hill neighborhood and Martin Acres so that hopefully students will move out of those single family uh, middle income housing and move into this um, organized housing. And also they provide workforce housing. These, these students will work in the 
uh, retail centers near them. We mentioned affordable housing. We have been doing quick back of the envelope calculations. I have to admit that we don't, nobody calculates this until we get to building permit. So your questions on what the four story provides are very important. I, I think back of the envelope, um, it's 12 million for the first three stories and 6 million for the fourth story. Um, if you want to ask us more about that, we might have more information. And we do want to retain the small businesses. We've worked very closely with Rocky Mountain Tennis Center to identify a transition plan and work with them as they move into the future. Um, their bubble in the floodplain is problematic and, and their continuation as a tennis center is something that we identified early on and we, we want to help them um, with a transition plan. And we would like to keep the daycare and Simba and the other small businesses in the cottages and flood protection. This current building is not flood protected. It is not out of the floodplain. There is no way to flood protect this building um, given the regulations and the floodplain. So I hope that answers some of your questions. We would love to hear more and have a discussion. So, thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Um, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I am knowing our team here will have lots of questions. So um, if you do have questions, please raise your hand and I will start to call on you. Come, come, I know people have questions. Don't be shy. Okay, Laura, then ML, then Kurt. Sarah, feel, feel free to um, ask me to pass the baton if I go too long. Why don't we just assume, ask three questions, then pass the baton. Okay, three questions. Uh, first, uh, this is a transportation related question. Uh, community Cycles wrote to us, and, and I think probably other people will pick up on some of their questions, but one is they didn't think it was clear whether the multi-use path on 28th Street was going to remain. Will it remain? Yes, it will yeah. remain. Okay, thank you. Um, second question. Um, uh, on page 47, it says the multi-use path will be fronted with an activity amenity program uses, including a few things, but it mentions an outdoor perch. What is an outdoor perch? Would you like me to take that, Danica? Yes. <laughs> I don't know what that is either. Sounds it, awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a private outdoor amenity just outside of the uh, like interior club room essentially. So it's um, a enclosed elevated deck area attached to the interior side of the, the building um, with lounge and overhead lighting. Um, so it's just off of the north-south multi-use path. Um, you kind of saw it in the fly through very quickly, but it's uh, essentially, yep, there it is. Thanks for pulling that up. It's essentially an additional amenity space um, adjacent to the north-south multi-use path. Could, could you point to it here? I don't, I'm not. It's just on the left-hand side of the screen oh, there. Okay. So, yep, it'll be a, a concrete paver area with overhead bistro lighting, soft seating, um, and then it's fully enclosed with a uh, fenced area. Okay, so it's like a fenced patio. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like a fenced patio, but I guess it's a little elevated, which is yes. why we're calling it the, the perch. Is that a common term that I should know, or is that um, specific to this project? No, it's just the design term that we came up with and it stuck. Okay, and um, can you tell me where guests will park? How are you gonna handle guest parking? So I think our, our parking reduction is overall for visitors and guests. So everything is um, shared, unbundled, managed paid parking. Uh, I think that I, I, I don't, actually know the answer to where guests will park. There's probably a limitation. They can park for two hours. Uh, Rob or Andrew, do you wanna answer that a little further, how you'll manage that? Yeah, so um, we would expect that, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, yeah, so we would expect that um, you know, many people would use the alternative transportation routes um, to visit residents of our property. Um, but we will identify some spaces that would be for temporary guest parking. So that could be in any of the three surface lots? Yes. Yeah, we haven't defined where they would be exactly yet. OK, thank you. I'll pass on. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. OK, ML, then Kurt. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Danica and team, for your presentation. I think you clarified some things. And I'm going to just riff off of something you were sounding excited about, which was um, the historic, um, I guess, happenings on this site, uh, Scott Carpenter. And um, when you look at that picture, I don't know if it was your staff, the building, the original hotel. Um, no, the original hotel. Oh. I don't think we have it in our <laughs> It's deck. just like a very, it was a staff, oh, a very cool building. Um, so my question is, um, you know, this happens, and I guess this happens everywhere. There's something that was cool, and then it became not so cool because of all the things that happened at the millennial, all the changes and upgrades and whatnot. Um, but it, there is some really nice history that is unique and special. And it seems that we tend to lose this when new projects come to town, you know, density and the programming um, is different than it was back when it was a hotel and, and et cetera, et cetera. So I heard you say you were acknowledging that it, there was some cool history here um, and it went to the Carnegie. Um, what are you doing on site? Are you doing, are, is there a nod to the history of this particular piece of land in Boulder and the buildings that um, inhabited it historically on this, pro on this project? Uh, that's a great question, Emel. Um, we did document the social history, which talks about all the cool things that happened, which is a, a report that's at the Carnegie with photos and a lot of crazy parties and <laughs> interesting things. Um, the site review process doesn't, we don't explore what to do about signage or, you know, talking about that. I think that we would be very open to memorializing that it's it's um just not part of what we're talking about tonight but i think that it would be totally appropriate to create signage or rooms that document it or you know mm -hmm. places that um express mm -hmm. that the fish observatory is a way to continue into the future that was a very like um Important. 70s mm -hmm. 80s thing that and i will note that the, the city would like to improve the observatory. It is not at its height at the moment. It's the windows are blocked in. It's a little murky and not accessible. So we have been talking to Parks and Rec about the, the idea that they will improve that area and we will maintain it. So that's part of the agreements that we've been discussing. There's a lot of negotiations that are happening and will continue to happen about how to maintain that area right um the tennis you know has been there for a long time so we're trying to re you know respect that with some pickleball and working with them into the future and also just creating this great public space it won't be a party zone because it's students and you know it won't be the friday afternoon club but we hope <laughs> that it will also be a great public space, kind of mm -hmm. reflecting the Civic Center. Um, a lot of our design inspiration came from what the city did with the Civic Center around the library and creating riparian areas and accessible areas and nature friendly kid areas. And so, you know, it's moving into the future. Um, but that building is not able to be maintained no. floodplain. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. I wouldn't, yeah, <laughs> I can't even get the right language. It's like, no, that building should be coming down. I think that that was a good move on, on your part. I am just 
architecturally looking for, I mean, you you created this sort of cool little, what the little raised perch thing. It just, there are things. And, it, and I would go back to that. If you have not seen the slide that our staff put out there about the original hotel, it's a pretty cool, sleek little Art Deco building. I mean, it, it was it was nice. And wouldn't that be cool to do a nod, you know, back to, hey, this, there was some value here. And, you know, find those little, you know, jewels that you might be able to articulate um, because you've got a lot of possibilities, you know, on the site. So that that's my first question. Thank you for um, actually bringing it up in your presentation. Um, I have uh, two, two other questions. Um, so it's encouraging you know, to see the investment in the creek area. So the question I have, are there any thoughts on how to manage unintended consequences, you know, such as camping and that kind of thing? Um, sure, I think this is a problem where I faced on a lot of projects I'm working on. I think that currently the property, all of the property is privately owned. So the Harvest Millennium, the Millennium Hotel, moves people on so the encampments and um have not been happening there because it is privately owned i think mm -hmm. that would be continue to be the tradition mm -hmm. um there is um you know when it, when you're a private property owner you yeah. Can yeah. work on that more effectively our goal is also to activate the space more intentionally so that it is less attractive mm -hmm. to um long term involvement. Yeah, that's a great strategy. This is a sensitive subject and um but I think that by activating it right. and you know but we're balancing lighting, we don't want to put a bunch of lights out there because it's a sensitive creek habitat and so we're trying to restore riparian areas and create bushes but also create access. So I do think that our plan and what Wink has done is really incredible and we can continue to refine that to mm -hmm. make sure it's a safe and welcoming space. I think the fact that it's a private, I, it hadn't occurred to me that that could be that would be absolutely a factor. You can you can do what you, you know, you can manage your property um, as you see fit, and that you've got activities, and that makes a huge difference. Um, so my last question is, and I asked staff this: is um, the uh, ground floor residential use, and um, the criteria or the rationale that they cited was it provides a compatible, your ground floor residential provides a compatible transition between higher intensity and lower intensity use. Can you, Claire, can you expand on that? What, where are the higher, what, what is the transition? Where is the transition, higher intensity and lower intensity? And how is that, how is that manifested in the, in the plan to warrant the residences on the ground floor? Um, I don't know if it's about higher intensity. It's about, um, there was a few years ago, there was an ordinance created to in, encourage retail on the ground floor in the zone districts, but because we're set back so far from 28th street um, because, and the floodplain would preclude us from putting retail right on 28th street. Mm -hmm. We are proposing that the ground floor be activated with um, the residential uses, which are academic study centers, workout centers, um, leasing oh. centers. So it's not about- So they're not residences, they're amenities on it's the ground both. floor? It's both, oh. but it's not um, like retail that would be- competing with the shopping center next to us because we don't have that proximity to the the street and signage right so I think right. it's I don't know if it's about intensity it's more about use and so what we've tried to do is the ground floor then has walk-up units more permeability more accessibility and any of the uses that would be especially the bike use, the multi-use path that comes through the center of the site, everything there is like that perch that we were talking about right. is about activating the people that live there with the people that might be traveling through there. So it's really creating 
as much as we can interaction and active mm -hmm. activation on the ground floor mm -hmm. without throwing, you know, a bunch of retail that wouldn't mm -hmm. thrive in this location. Yeah. And this Great. was a topic of discussion with um, initial review for a site review about locating those active uses immediately on that pedestrian pass through mm -hmm. rather than on the 28th street side. So the 28th street side on that very Northeast corner um, has some, you know, um, study rooms and, and student entries and things like that. And that's where the entry is located, mm -hmm. but it was a deliberate design choice from a um, pedestrian and active use to put those components, fitness club room, um, bike room and all of that on the pedestrian path, rather than associating it to 28th because a, it's so far away right. and b, it's so vehicularly oriented. So mm -hmm. good question. Thank you. Um, I like that answer. You know, I like the answer that the pedestrian pathway that goes through actually has some intentionality. You don't just feel like you're going to someone's house, <laughs> right? To someone's residence. Great. Th those are my three questions. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, ML. All right, um, Kurt, before I call on you, I know that um, George is operating on a completely different time zone. So George, if you have any questions, do you wanna ask them? No, I, I'm okay at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Right. You're welcome. Kurt, uh, questions? <clears throat> okay, yeah, I will uh, start with my ration of three questions. So my first question is similar to the last question that ML asked. If, if conceptually, if you were to flip building one east-west, then you would no longer, you wouldn't have to request the use review. Is that correct? But you chose to design it that way because of what you said about activating along the, the multi-use path there? Yeah, and it, uh, one factor among many. Right. Yeah. So there was a choice there and there was discussion back and forth and we did revise. Um, it was previously all units along that farthest east face. Um, and then it became kind of a blend. So that northeast corner has some public activity and then it breaks into residences after that entry as you work your way south. But if you were and, to move all those residences to the west side and the other things to the east side, then you wouldn't need to request use for the re use review. Is that right? Danica, I think we'd have use review regardless, right? Yeah, I, I think it, I, unfortunately, it's not that simple. I think, I think that the code says that ground floor should be non-residential on street facing buildings. And, and so, those things are considered residential because they're in service of a residential. Yes. Yeah. 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 And yeah. so um, okay. the, the code was written to kind of support the, I, I think it was actually a base mar was being proposed to be redeveloped as all residential. And it was like, how do we retain neighborhood retail on the ground floor and support residential above? So it, it, the intention is right. It's just, we don't have the access to the street that other, you know, properties might have. I, I, I believe that's the intention. So we we the site would not ever support a lot of retail. It's just not sure. And so I don't think it would matter what we did with the buildings. We just tried to make the best of it and activate the multi-use path so that when people travel through the site, they might see their friends or they might pull over and, you know, pump up their bike or throw a frisbee on the lawn and make the best of this unique circumstance of a very flood prone property. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe I can get staff to weigh in uh, later about whether, just to verify that those non apartment uses like the fitness center and stuff would not qualify as non residential uses. Uh, second question. But maybe then, Shannon can weigh in now. I, I see her. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we would consider those uses like accessory as, as part of the residential use. Yeah. So okay. flipping it wouldn't necessarily um, change the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is what about what appears to be a path to, on the north side of buildings two and three between the sidewalk on Olson Drive and the buildings? And I can't tell what material it is 
or really what the purpose is. And so uh, could you talk about what, what is the idea with that? If yeah, I'm yeah. reading Kaylin, the you, plans right now. Yeah, maybe I'm gonna pass it to Kaylin, yeah. Kaylin okay. the architect. Yeah, so the path on the north side of the building is kind of serving a couple of things. Um, it's one for sort of interior site circulation. Um, we're also utilizing that area for our sort of trash and um, service back and forth between the sites. So um, we will have trash from the east side of the site that will be taken to the west side of the site and picked up on that end. Um, and we are not allowed to use the public sidewalk um, as means for, for that service. So we provided a secondary pathway closer to the buildings um, that is providing that on-site service for such um, trash and such other services as needed on-site. So um, that is primarily the reason that we have it on the north side of the site. Um, we're also, as far as material goes, that'll be an enhanced concrete with a crusher finds the shoulder on that edge. So it will be um, materially consistent with the rest of the site as far as wayfinding um, and will be more unique than the standard concrete paving on the sidewalk. So the city says you're not allowed to let people roll their bins or whatever down the sidewalk? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, those were the specific words given to us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, interesting. And, and, the, uh, and the city sidewalk has to be gray and dull, but the one we're putting in board can be not gray and dull. Okay. Exactly. There's a, there's a logic there. I'm sure there is. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, last question. So uh, you're doing a certain amount of cut and a certain amount of fill. It looks like you're doing more fill than cut, right? And so you'll be bringing in fill and have you identified where, well, how much fill that'll be, like how many dump truck loads and where will it be coming from? Do you have any idea? Cody, that sounds like a question for you. Yeah, so Kurt, we, so it's a great question because we've been thinking about this a lot. The irony is that we're actually pretty close to matching our cut and fill volumes on the site due to the floodplain requirements. Um, and, and really the building up of the, of the buildings themselves are going to be done mostly um, with the foundations and then we will have obviously some dirt underneath of the buildings themselves but the rest of the site is actually at or around existing grade and we're trying to keep that pretty well balanced in here due to the floodplain regulations so we're having to be really cognizant of that we haven't done any sort of calculations in terms of cut fill volume yet um, we were actually waiting for the clomer to get approved and it just got approved not that long ago i think a couple weeks ago um, so we'll start to dive into really refining our grading in the tech doc process, and we could have some more answers at that point for you in terms of total cut and fill. Okay, yeah, because one of the site review criteria, as you probably know, relates to minimizing cut and fill, so. Yes, that was key criteria in all the floodplain discussions for sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kurt. And Mark, you're next. And this is not specific because you're the one talking, but we have a whole bunch of people in the public line of who have comments. It's already 945. If we could really keep our questions quite targeted so that we can move forward to the public comments, that would be awesome. Great. I, that, Sarah, thank you. That informs a decision I was trying to make. So here goes. Two questions only. Um, do you feel, this is direct to the applicant, the you, do you feel clear about who maintains what and under what regulations uh, you can do things, program things in terms of the south side of the building and the creek path and south of the creek path? And if, if you are confident in what you can and can't do, who maintains what, um, what informs you that uh, that allows you to be confident? Uh, 
That's a great question. We've had a lot of discussions, lots and lots of meetings with OSMP, um, Parks and Rec, Darren Wagner with um, Parks and Rec has been especially in contact. So part, I think, of the next steps will be delineating those maintenance agreements. Once we know what they want to do with the fish observatory, we have easements over the multi-use path. The city will maintain the multi-use path, but they will have easements over the larger public property so that if they need to make improvements. So yes, this is an incredible partnership with the city. I wish that the rest of the city staff were here tonight because I think that they see this as an opportunity as well to get maintenance over something that has been unregulated for many, many years. The Fish Observatory was like a handshake agreement that a few people did and somebody was supposed to take care of it. Nobody did. So I think everybody sees this as an opportunity for the future. So our discussions with the city have been they would improve the observatory to the degree that the public wants and through some master planning and we would maintain it, um, which is kind of a historic agreement that Harvest House maintain the observatory. So I think it's going to improve things immensely um, in a way that wasn't there before. So, but we are still working on those agreements and that will be part of the conditions of us moving forward. Okay, great. I, I hope that uh, you as an applicant have, uh, have just as much interest in detailing those agreements so that uh, future misunderstandings, misinterpretations are minimized. Um, in the same vein, uh, do you see how um, the public having historically, you know, we're so proud of our creek paths and access to Boulder Creek, and it's it's just part of every Boulderite's existence, This the, the creek path, that with the alignment as it is, and I'm coming around to the alignment uh, with the big curve to the north, but the perception will be, I predict, that that space south of the creek path is public. It's like that is, a, it's a, it will be assumed that that will be um, OSMP. You know, people don't know who controls the creek paths now anyway. Anyway, I, my concern is that, um, that- Mark, Mark. Can you yep. maybe hold your concern until we have our dialogue? Please ask your next question. All right, that was that was it. So the question was, do you understand that people are going to perceive that as public? Yes, and I think that that's the intention is that it's public. It's privately owned public space, so it will be maintained that way. I don't the the private space is enclosed and fenced and off limits. The rest of it is for the community. That's right, what's you. awesome about this. I mean, I think it's really cool that we're going to have all this um, open space that people can access and use for different reasons and purposes. And so, and the alignment of the path was purely to create this incredible civic space for the public, mim mimicking the civic area uh, near the library so that we have this great lawn and this access and also controlled access to the creek that was very important to the city, that not everybody can go to the creek whenever they want, wherever they want, because that creates um, degradation to the riparian system. So this um, creates a, 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 like a lot of different opportunities for different people. And quite honestly, it's a floodplain that creates this for us as an opportunity. So I think it's amazing. And, you know, you can have a dog park, you know, pickleball, you can have the fish observatory, you can go sit on a lawn, you can sit under a tree um, and you can go fishing, but that those spaces will all be available to people traveling through there. Great. Thank you. I'm done with my questions. Thank you, Mark. All right. If you have a question that is actually you need to ask it in order to understand how you're gonna vote on this project. Raise your hand. If it's just a question because you're interested in X, Y, or Z, I'm gonna take executive uh, privilege here and move us along. 
Alrighty. Okay. Thank you applicants for your presentation and thank uh, all the board members for your interesting questions. And we are now gonna go to public comments. Um, uh, Vivian will take control from here. Go ahead, Vivian. Great, so Can just we, wanna... we turn our cameras off? What, what's your expectation, Sarah? Uh, I think we'd prefer to have the cameras off. And if we have questions, once we get to deliberations, we'll, we'll call on you and ask our questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very, very much. I see a couple of people have already popped their hands up, um, but if others could do that as well, if you'd like to make any comments, I'd appreciate it. So we'll start with Kendall Chitember, followed by Jonathan Singer, and you each have three minutes. So um, Kendall, please go ahead. Uh, Kendall, we can't hear you. Uh, you just muted yourself. There you go. There, can I, you I guys hear me over. okay? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so I, I wanted to share that as, as wait, one wait, of the I'm three- I'm sorry, Kendall, Kendall, you have to introduce yourself and um, give us your name and a general sense of where you live. Absolutely. So my name is Kendall Chitomber. Um, I am a city of Boulder resident. Um, I live in North Boulder. Um, I'm one of the three business owners of the Rocky Mountain Tennis Center uh, that is located on the grounds of the Millennium uh, Harvest House Hotel. Um, and as a lifelong tennis player and 35 year professional tennis coach and tennis teacher, I have to say, I absolutely love tennis. Um, uh, as a Boulder resident, I'm unbelievably passionate about being a tennis provider in our beautiful city for the last 20 years while serving as the same for the surrounding communities as well. It's been nothing short of my life's privilege to have the uh, incredible opportunity to be part of growing and developing our sport in so many ways at the former Harvest House. And uh, since 2012, we've been the Rocky Mountain Tennis Center. Uh, we at Rocky Mountain Tennis Center know this project is happening and quite honestly it needs to happen. Uh, we know our time here is short, but we truly and deeply appreciate all our many years with the Millennium Hotel. And we're so grateful to the Millennium and the Landmark Development Team working directly with us to provide every opportunity to keep uh, RMTC tennis going strong and even growing for the last uh, years um, while they have been developing this important project, giving us much needed time to make our next steps. The path forward remains tremendously important to us, to the tennis community. And we look forward to continuing to work with Danica and the project team on a transition plan ahead, honestly, hopefully to a new site. Thank you so much for your time and letting me speak to you guys tonight. Thank you, Kendall. So next up we have um, Jonathan Singer. And you can also introduce yourself a bit, um, and you have three minutes. Please go ahead, Jonathan. Good evening. I'm Jonathan Singer. I'm the Senior Director of Policy Programs at the Boulder Chamber. And given how late this meeting is going, I'm pretty sure I live there now, too. Um, I, I wanted to thank, actually, um, staff for, excuse me, <coughs> for their amazing work. Um, not only um, on working with this applicant, but on the previous um, discussion on issue 5A, uh, I know the Boulder Chamber has been working for quite some time now to really reduce the log jam and create common sense solutions. And we're really appreciative of every everyone from Lisa to Brad to the entire planning staff team for their diligent, thoughtful work to make sure we're balancing community and business needs. That being said, with this, um, this specific uh, project that we're talking about today, um, these are the kinds of projects that the Boulder Chamber is thrilled to see. Um, when you talk about a win-win case, I really look at this as a win-win-win-win-win. Um, we're talking about over $15 million of cash in lieu, additional flood protection, um, retention of those small businesses that we all value, including a daycare, um, but also decreasing pressure on single-family homes, which have because of market pressures, been oftentimes um, taken over by the student population today. This is one answer to help address that one part of the problem. Also, we look at workforce housing and decreasing commuter miles. 
And frankly, students who are forced to live further and further out are going to be commuting into CU Boulder's campus. Um, this, op this presents an opportunity to allow our students to live, study, and work in the same community. Um, and also the creation of public space. And, and I'll close on, on this real point here. Um, I was uh, a young lad in 1988, moved, uh, didn't move to Boulder in 1988, but visited Boulder. The first place I stayed was the Harvest House. I don't think it was called the Millennium yet. And uh, I remember going um, and enjoying all those different amenities along the bike path. And then after moving here in 1992 um, with my family, um, biking from East Boulder um, all the way to the Boulder Public Library where I was able to volunteer um, using the bike path going by the Millennium. And um, we have to honor our history but we also have to honor our history in a way that provides a way for future generations to enjoy this. And the millennium is obviously, uh, unfortunately, overstayed its welcome. But now we have an application here that really looks at the long term in preserving the character, improving the, uh, the amenities, and providing for the future needs of our community by ensuring that we have housing that's available for students, in a way that actually enables more of our workforce, not only students, but more of our traditional workforce to be able to find that additional housing stock in the long run. This isn't a panacea, but this is a great first step and we look forward to the approval. Thank you, Jonathan. I don't see any other hands raised. If anybody else wishes to speak, please go ahead and raise your hand now. Okay, Lynn, please go ahead. You have three minutes. I have never approved for this project. The Millennium Harvest House had 269 rooms. The, these students will be 900 rooms in this space. CU is a big boy. They can fund their own housing. This is not a relief. I completely disagree with Jonathan. This is not a relief for me and others in the community. I'm at 6th and Dewey, by the way, Lynn Siegel. And this is just a massive, massive abomination. Across the street, CU owns all of 28th Street on the east. Now, they're, you know, they're like an octopus. They're the elephant in the living room. They are a state entity. We are a city. We deserve to keep our city here. I want to ride my friggin' bike along the creek path not into the student housing, insulting myself, having to get any nearer them than I'm already forced to be all the time. The students in this community have taken over. We've got CU South coming up, doubling the size of CU. There is no excuse for you to do one exception, one height amendment, one parking restriction, no subsidies for this project, zero. Four stories, it's obscene. I'm speechless with anger at what my town has become. And I lived here from 58 to 60. My mom and dad met in the hiking club and I've been here since 87. And there's not a corner where another condo is coming in. This is high-end housing. Okay, for the $60,000 uh, tuition and who knows what this is gonna cost for these students. That's 54 million bucks a year just for tuition. CU's a big kid. They can pay their own friggin' way. This is an abomination. It's too bad this didn't get onto the historic Civic Center. It should have gone all the way down to 28th Street, as all the way up to even fine. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you very um, much. No, I'm not done. I've got 25 oh, seconds. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. I'm just, breath, I'm just speechless it. with anger at this at this project. I'm speechless that you even have you even can think about any any um, subsidies for them. The, do you know this the city of the city of Boulder 
needs sales tax revenue. We had that with the millennium. We've given it away to see you. And we're a little short on sales tax revenue, rightly. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Any other else? hands? Sorry, sorry, Vivian. I don't see right. any others over to you, Chair. Right. I would like to make a quick recommendation, two minute bio break. We come back and we start our discussion, maybe take a straw poll, see where people are at this point, and, uh, and then we'll move forward from there. So two minute break. Right. So all of oh, Mark just left us. <laughs> we were all here for a moment. Um, so uh, super interesting questions, super interesting presentations. And um, I'm sure that we all have a lot to say. I'm also aware that it is 10.05 and we often lose Lisa by 10.30 and George is in far, far away. And it's very yeah. early in the morning, very early in the morning where he is. Um, so I think what might make sense, I'm curious if you all, how do you all feel about taking a quick straw poll, um, thumbs up, thumbs down on, uh, on the proposal in front of us as is, or would you prefer to have some discussion first and then take a straw poll? Go ahead, Mark. I just, um, I was thinking about this and I appreciate this path of, my question is, um, should we take a straw poll? Does anyone have conditions that they would want to uh, discuss? Because that, anyway, if we have conditions, suddenly it's a much longer night than if we don't have conditions. Uh, thank you for that, Mark. We'll come back to your question, ML. Um. We have been sort of framing our discussion around the key issues. 
Do we not want to do that? No, I'm happy to do that. I just wanted to get a sense first of whether we have, I mean, if it's, if it's 704, then there, we don't even need to have a discussion. Um, I don't know that that's going to be the case, but it would be helpful to know whether, um, like sort of where we are. I'm not saying we have to do it, um, but it might be worth while. Um, I have some serious, I can just state right now, I have some serious concerns uh, and uh, uh, I'm, I may be the only one, but um, uh, it would be helpful to know if it's 706143, whatever it might be before we start our discussion. So um, that's sort of the thinking I was putting out there. You can tell me I'm wrong and that you don't want to do it this way, but I just was, was trying to make a suggestion. Um, Kurt, can, I ask a, can I ask a question real quick, Sarah, just of clarification of what you just said? Yeah. When you said you have serious, serious concerns, you have serious concerns that could cause you to thumbs down on the approval altogether or that you might want to put conditions on it? No, that would be thumbs down on the of the project as it's proposed. And with and the condition, what what I'm up, what I'm concerned about, it can't be fixed with a condition. Gotcha. I, I think that's good to know if there are other folks who are in the same boat, or if people uh, are mostly maybe, thinking so maybe conditions. Maybe we have discussion. Maybe what would be helpful is uh, may, let's maybe do what ML suggests and go through the key issues, and that will highlight the issues that. Maybe I'm the only one ha who has it, but um, it could be a way to go. Um, Kurt, do you want to add something, please? Oh, I was just going to answer Mark's question and say I have conditions. Okay. All right. So let's do this. Let's go through the key issues. Um, at that, in each of these key issues, we can each bring up the things that we are concerned about or might want to have a condition of. Um, and I think if we can quick do a quick round quickly do this, and I'm, I'm not trying to get us done before 1030, but I am trying to not make this a two hour process um, if we can avoid that. Um, so let's start with key issue number one, which is, um, uh, is the proposed project on balance consistent with the site review criteria 9-2-14H, including findings related to consistency with the Boulder Valley Comp Plan policies? Sarah, um, can I, can I, I have a, I'm sorry, I hate to do this, but since this is our first time using the, the new criteria, I have a serious concern with how key the, issue one. We're not using the new criteria. We are using the old criteria because this was proposed back at, this has been going through under the old criteria. Oh, okay. I, I still have a, a concern with how this key issue number one is phrased because in, in my um, understanding, it's not about whether the project is on balance consistent with the site review criteria. It's required to meet the site review criteria. The only on balance is applying to the BBCP policies as, as far as I know. So this felt like a huge change to me if we're being asked, is the project on balance consistent with the site review criteria in general? Uh, fair enough. Um, I think you could break it down into two, two questions, one being consistent with site review criteria which is really actually part of question number two. And question number one would then be consistency with Boulder Valley Comp Plan policies. Are you guys mm -hmm. okay if we slightly modify key issue number one to BBCP policies? Okay, right. key issue number one, uh, what are our thoughts about, is the project on balance consistent with uh, the BBCP, BBCP policies? Um, and land use map is how it's usually framed, BBC and pub, land. yeah. Okay, yeah. and land use number. I'm just gonna go down the line and either say yes, or if it's no, say what the no's are about. So Kurt. Um, <clears throat> so my no's are about the, uh, the facade design, just the materiality, the number of materials, well, um, which is really from something from the site review criteria. That's not Kurt, 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 Kurt. That's not that's not comp plan. That'll go under. Oh, this is um, comp plan only. Yeah, just comp plan only. I'm sorry. Comp plan only. Um, well, okay. Then yes. Okay. Um, and we'll have ample opportunity with these other issues to talk about specific uh, concerns. Um, Laura, comp plan. So 
I don't love how they meet BVCP 2.41 section J, which talks about fostering appeal of buildings through attractive, well-designed architecture and innovative approaches to design. I don't love the design of this building. I think it's a missed opportunity for enhanced design, um, but there's enough to love about this project and it meets enough of the BVCP policies that I will say that yes, it on balance meets the BVCP policies. And I do think it's consistent with the land use map. Okay, Mark. Yes, Laura said it for me, uh, the design is a missed opportunity, but on whole, yes. Okay, ML. I agree. Laura, you can be my spokesperson on the key issue number one. You, you, did, you covered all the bases. Sure. Sure. High five. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I'm in the similar boat. My, my issues lie kind of with the rest of it. Okay, uh, Elisa. Yes, can you hear me? <gasps> yes, we can. We can. Gift of AirPods. Um, same as everybody else. Um, I, I could maybe make some finicky argument that it doesn't, but overall, I think it's fine. And my concerns will come up below. Okay. All right. Uh, key issue number two are the modification. Well, key issue number two is going to be site review criteria and the modifications, including building stories and height and parking reduction, oh. consistent with site review criteria. Can we? Sarah, did you weigh in on key issue one? I, I, from in terms of the pub, the policies, the ones I think it does not meet are tangential to the discussion. So I'm, I'm fine with it as okay. I'm fine with whether it meets BBCP policies. I'm not fine with other elements. Got it. So key issue number two A is general site review criteria. Key issue two B is specifically the modifications requested for building stories and height. And parking reduction are they consistent with review site review criteria um pert uh so no uh well sorry what, what, i, I a, am key, key issue 2a is site review criteria in general key issue 2b is the height and parking reduction criteria uh, modification requests so no on a and yes on b Okay, so no, tell us a bit about, unpack no a bit for us. Right, uh, it's about uh, a couple of things, mostly the facade um, detailing and, and finish building materials uh, and the complexity of all that. Um, and also the, the this um, access, to the east parking area and the the implications for the safety of multimodal travel. Okay, great. Lisa, I'm gonna to turn to you next. A similar. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, similar. I'm sorry, I'm trying to think about how much I want to say given the hour. Um I think other people will speak to this more eloquently, but I'm not convinced that we need the height change. I know why they're asking for it. I also think it leads to really boring architectural design sorry to architects um <laughs> yeah we we built a box that fills the area that we could build into which we do a lot because that's how our code maximizes highest and best use for a developer but um yeah i'm, I'm not so sure about height specifically and, and have some other concerns as well that other people i think will talk about better okay um george i'm going to go to you next thank you um a, a few quick comments um i'm, I'm kind of surprised that this already went through DAB and this is what we got as planning I know. board. I know, isn't that weird? Um, because it, it just looks like a giant unarticulated box. Um, the masses of these buildings are not, um, they're, they're just really contiguous and flat. Um, and so I, I'm not okay with the height modification as is because I, I think that um, some rework needs to be done to make these buildings more interesting um, and not look like they're from the like a 70s tenement. I, I just they, they just don't look right to me. Um, and, and that's my biggest issue. I think the parking reduction, once that is sorted out, I, I think the parking reduction is unrealistic with um, where this is at and the kind of clientele that this is going after. Right. I do think that um, not providing the height um, or 
or giving the building some really considered um, articulation will solve for some of that. Um, so I'll leave it there and let other people try it. Okay, ML, since you were being responsive, uh, you go next. Since I'm being responsive? You were responding, you, you, were, you were articulating a response to George. So I thought <laughs> I might as well just go to you next. No, I'm taking notes. Thanks, George. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all are helping me tonight. Um, so parking reduction, it, it wasn't clear to me that the population they are targeting students, that's a kind of a big, broad thing. They talked about the students that are inhabiting houses, um, taking up rentals. You know, every Boulderite that went to see you that I know, they lived in houses and they packed themselves in. These are the people who probably are not gonna be able to afford I don't know if they're going to move people out of the houses and into, we didn't talk about cost. We didn't talk about where these are going to land in the market. Um, the fact that they've got uh, the significant number of units are four bedroom. Um, and I'm guessing that they probably have the strategy to rent by the bedroom. Um, but you know, speculation. So I didn't see any discussion or information about the parking reduction and how it's gonna mesh with the people who are going to be living there. If this is luxury student housing, which is what we've been seeing, if this is gonna hit those price points, it's going to be hard to imagine that the students are not gonna have a car. So. I think that there needs to be a direct relationship between the client they're hoping to serve and the parking requirements, the realistic parking requirements of those clients. I appreciate all of the management of alternative kinds of um, uh, thinking, um, but anyway, I I didn't I didn't see any supporting data that would convince that this population that they're targeting are not going to want cars. Um, in regard to the building stories, the building hype, it's incredibly um, compelling that they were able to solve the problem of where to build and how to build um, and give back to Boulder, give back this big green area and enhancement of the creek and some really, I think, um, generous moves. I'm still looking at this postcard that the staff put up. <laughs> That original Harvest House Motor Hotel was one, two, three, four, five stories. <laughs> um, it's a generic, it's a generic response. Once the site, the siding and the use of the land was articulated, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, It's very unfortunate that um, architecture, given who the people are that are doing this, isn't playing a key role. When I talk about the history of the original site, the original buildings, who was here that started kind of building um, this scale of buildings in the city, it wasn't so going to get translated into, oh, there's going to be a plaque in the lobby. And I'm talking about architecture. How do you go back? Um, look at Scott Carpenter. I mean, it's a park, but it's got a little rocket ship. I mean, 
do something that drives it home. And I, this building, they solved the problem of how to get the site to function, but they didn't make architecture. So I know key issue number two doesn't ask if they made architecture, um, but I, I would say that our desire in Boulder to have um, good buildings, good architecture, and um, things that respond to place, that's real. You know, that's real. We want accountability to that. And I'm in agreement with whoever said, what happened to DAB? <laughs> I went and read their minutes and they're just like, huh, they were all concerned about one, you know, right the north, the north side. And so I, I have to say that key issue number two is gravely lacking. Thank you, ML. Mark, then Laura, and then I have some comments. Um, yes, I believe this meets the site review criteria as this is operating under the, the code that is being applied to this site. Um, yes, I uh, think that the stories and height um, are acceptable and applicable and of community benefit in light of the rough numbers we have for um, the inclusionary housing program. They're meeting that. And that the parking reduction is actually just fine with me. I think, I think this applicant has a pretty robust TDM plans. I have, I have a complaint about the TDM plan, but I'll save that for later or not at all. Uh, but and I don't think, I, I agree with people, I struggle with the design, but we can't, we don't specify exact design in our code. So does it meet the code? Yes. Is the parking, is the height okay? Yes. Is the parking reduction consistent with the review criteria? Yes. And cutting down a floor will not uh, heal any architectural wounds. Okay, Laura, thank you, Mark. Laura? You have to unmute. There. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I'm scrolling around. Um, so again, I don't love the design, and I think I'm looking at the right version of the code, BRC 9-2-14 H3B little i says, Larger floor plate buildings and projects with multiple buildings have a variety of forms and heights. And this building would be a stretch to say that that is true. Um, but in general, I do think it meets the applicable site review criteria. I think having all of the tree screening on this building, on these buildings, helps a lot with how it's going to look from the creek path and how it will be compatible with the surrounding environment. So I would say, yes, I think it meets the applicable site review criteria. In terms of the height modification, the existing hotel that is there now is 60 feet in height. And this proposal is lower than that in terms of building height. It's only like 52 or 53 feet high, although the site will be elevated. And so apparently in the applicant's analysis and in the staff's uh, concurrence, it's kind of a wash in terms of whether this would be uh, about the same height. It's about the same height as what is there now. And so I don't have a problem with compatibility to have that kind of height. And, you know, my understanding is that um, when we, we, we really want to have the community benefit, and that is one of the things that uh, drives us to, to grant height modifications is if it's, if it's compatible, and it's justified on the site and we can get the community benefit, that's important to me. And so I am inclined to say this height modification is, is just fine. And I think staff's rationale was perfectly appropriate for why this could be granted under the code. So I'm fine with the height modification. I'm also fine with the parking reduction, given that it is student housing. And you know, I do think that, as I've said in previous meetings, students are among the most likely people to live without a car in Boulder. The places they need to go is their job, campus, grocery store, 
and any kind of like uh, socialization and nightlife and all of that. And this site is so well located. There's literally a grocery store right behind it. You walk across Olson and there's the Safeway, right? Um, and so that's one of the big things that people need a car for. Campus is literally right across the street and there's an underpass there. Like, I think that this is a great location for students living without a car. If this were concept review, I probably would push for more in the TDM plan, more car sharing, uh, maybe having um, uh, a scooter location, scooter rentals, something more innovative and, and maybe a longer period of runway for those uh, eco passes. But this isn't concept review, this is site review. And I'm not gonna deny the project based on their TDM plan could be better. Um, I do think that the parking reduction is appropriate. Thank you. All right. This is where I, I'm going to vote no on this. Uh, so I'm starting with the mass scale and density issue, which is the height modification, height variance that's being requested. The proposal offers a, what is essentially a fault equivalence in terms of the height, mass, and scale of what is there now and what is being proposed. What is there now may be 60 feet tall, but it takes up about a third of the land mass. What's being proposed is 53 feet tall and literally covers every inch of developable land. It is a huge, huge project. And because they're trying to maximize how much they how much they can build, they've added this fourth floor, which then uh, triggers the massive amount of parking that they need that they are requesting a 50% parking reduction for. Um, so first of all, the building is much too big. It does not need to be four stories. It can be three stories uh, and adequately house less than 960 beds, but it would still be student housing. Uh, and then you wouldn't have the same parking problem. Plus, just in terms of the parking, uh, I, I read the, the Tuttle Fox report or the Fox Tuttle report, and I also read the TDM planning report. I read them very carefully. And I'm just gonna read what I've written here. It's probably a little verbose because I was writing and trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to say. So staff states on, the applicant and staff have made an a, a, a apples to bananas comparison that's not credible when it comes to the elements of their parking reduction formula or, or argument. So on page 17 of 141, staff states, while the city's off-street parking requirements would require 728 parking spots, the parking analysis indicated a parking demand of significantly fewer spaces based on national data for multifamily apartments with adjustments specific to student housing and considerations for the specific location. However, this is essentially refuted by Fox Tuttle's own report, which quotes, the quote of which is, the parking generation manual does not have data, it doesn't have data pertaining to student housing and there is no national standard to estimate parking demand for student housing. That's page 129 of 141 of our packet. Instead, Fox Tuttle has made what I consider to be a huge assumption that trip generation for multifamily housing and trip generation for student housing would be similar for parking demand. That's a huge assumption that's very easy to poke holes in. Multifamily, multifamily housing is made up of folks who are driving all the time, commuting, driving to errands, taking kids to school, et cetera. Students don't drive as much, but that does not indicate how many cars there will be. That's about how many vehicle miles traveled there will be. Um, so Fox Tuttle has calculations are based on an assumption that student housing generates 18 less vehicle trips than would, uh, would family housing. And it literally has no meaning when it comes to how many students are gonna have cars. So that's my, that is a fundamental, huge, gigantic assumption that I do not think is at all applicable. It's, it's an assumption. We could assume that none of these students will have cars, but that is not an assumption that we should be making. Um, we also know, because we've heard this in other proposals, that lease language restricting vehicle ownership only covers people who plan to park their car at the site. It doesn't mean they won't have cars. It just means they're not gonna pay the extra money 
to park their car there. In addition, I don't think that the alternative transportation fund of $75 a year is enough. Uh, I actually looked up Zipcar. Zipcar student membership may be $35 a year, but there's a minimum per hour cost of $11 an hour and $80.50 $80 a day. There's your year, there's your year $75 gone in one day if you decide to drive up to the mountains for the day. Um, so to me, the height and the parking is connected. Uh, and I know we all are very excited about the fact that there'd be lots and lots of additional money because of the bonus area for um, going to a fourth floor. But that's just a given in when someone asks for a height modification that it's we're already going to be getting 25 percent uh, of for um, for permanently affordable housing just from three stories. And if you go to three stories, you solve the parking problem. Uh, so to me, uh, I, I can't vote for I cannot vote for what is being proposed today. And I don't think it's, you know, fixable through a uh, condition. So that's my position on this. Okay, key issue number three is the proposed ground floor residential consistent with the use review criteria of 9-2-15E. I'll start with Lisa. I don't think I have a huge issue with this. Um, given the high foot track and traffic and location, I would also maybe be interested in some more uh, creative use, but I, I think it's fine. I think it meets the use group criteria. Okay, thank you, George. Yeah, I, 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 I tend to agree. And actually back to your argument, Sarah, on issue two, I mean, this is where, this is where housing can be obtained at this site um, without, the impacts of the, you know, and, and of what you talked about. Um, so I, I'm in general, uh, believe it's consistent, especially given the circumstances um, and considering the other issues that we're wrestling with. Okay. ML. Um, I think it is consistent. So key issue number three, um, yes. It's consistent with the use of your criteria. Okay, Mark. Yes. Laura. Yes, and before we move on, I just wanna make sure that we're all operating on the same information basis about the parking. I think I did read in the packet with the proposed lease language that uh, residents who do not pay for a parking space need to either certify that they do not plan to bring a car or if they do plan to bring a car that they are paying private parking and on other private parking uh, property. Pretty sure I read that somewhere in this huge packet. Did other people see that or am I imagining something? Uh, I didn't see that. Uh, and I don't think it would actually be legal. <laughs> you can't tell someone <laughs> they can't have a car. You can no, tell you, somebody you they can't, can't park. I, I did see something about that in the operating plan. Does anybody uh, know where that is in the packet so that we can just verify if it's there or not? Okay, it's going to be. Maybe that won't make a difference, but I just, I, I think they are trying to do what they can. I'll look for it, I'll, I'll, I'll search. Right. Oh, and we've and, seen and, that language in other, in other projects. Right. Well, that, that, that was okay. the first time I saw about you have to Guys, pay for private we'll parking. We'll come back to discussing this. We're trying to answer key issue number three, Laura. We'll come back to this. Uh, Kurt, key issue number yes, three. Yes, I do think it's met, but not based on the, the rationale that staff identified, but rather under point C, because it meets the housing need identified in the Boulevard complaint. Okay. All right, um, and key issue number four, and I'm not gonna take a position on key issue number three because I'm opposed to this project as it's proposed. So my position on key issue three is irrelevant. Um, key issue number four, does the board support the proposed amendments to the BVRC transportation connections plan? I'll start with you, Mark. Yes. Okay, Kurt. Uh, yes, the proposed amendment uh, I support that. Okay, Laura. Yes, I uh, see no reason to contradict Tab and Tab supported it, so yes. 
All right, ML. I agree. I believe it does. Um, I do support. Okay, Amen. George. So I'm sorry, ML. George. Uh, I, I'm okay with it because again, I'm I'm focused on uh, uh, other issues, so I think that's fine. Okay, Lisa. Yeah, this doesn't concern me out of the other stuff. Okay, so what I'm hearing is uh, that there's concern about the design, the 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 design of the building. There's concern about among some about the height, and there's concern concern among some about parking. Is that would 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 folks say I'm accurately reflecting back the three things that we are not in agreement on? Lisa, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, I, I do agree with that, Sarah. And I, I just wanted to also highlight, and I don't know who else is in this boat, um, but it is past 1030 on a Tuesday night. Um, I will be dropping off. Um, I don't know if other people want to as well, and if this is something we want to vote to continue or if we want to try to wrap it up tonight. Um, and I don't want to speak for anyone else, but I'll just say I think we're all moving slower and talking in more confused ways. And um, you know, yeah, I, if if people feel comfortable wrapping it up without, I I don't need you to continue it for me. I'm not pushing for any particular outcome. I also think continuing would be a reasonable choice given the hour and the time. Um, but anyway, I will I'll be dropping. Okay, wait, don't drop yet. Um, how okay. Do other how do other people feel about a continuation so that we are fresher and, and Lisa's not sick? I can hear that Lisa is sick and it's like four in the morning where George is. Uh, it's it's uh, 6.30 in the morning where I am. But, 6.30 um, in the morning. <laughs> so I'm, I'm okay continuing from my perspective. I also don't wanna lose Lisa. I, I think that's, that's also a, a key consideration. Uh, and I'm fine with continuing. How are other people? So that would be three. We, is there one more person who would like to continue this at a later date. I think I'd want to know when we're continuing it too. Are we continuing it for a month or are we continuing it and scheduling another meeting next week? Or we would continue, uh, we have to talk to staff. Uh, what I would, we would continue it to whenever the next meeting is. So I, I, I would only support continuation if people, uh, if board members had specific conditions that they wanted to advocate for. If we just want to end up with a 5-2 vote or a 4-3 a vote, and we want to complain about things, I'm not for continuing. If someone has conditions that they want to propose that deserve serious consideration and discussion, then I would propose continuing. So I don't have conditions that I am prepared to try and um, uh, advocate for tonight. Uh, Brad, I see you. Yeah, just a logistical note that if you were to continue it, we would always advocate for continuing to a date certain, and we can help you figure out what would be the earliest next date. Uh, not doing it to date certain means that the whole public noticing process and such has to be redone and can be seen as a disservice to the public. What okay, date so certain look good, Brad? Uh, I'm going to have to rely on other folks to tell me when the next hearing date Can I is. ask, while, while staff is looking for what another date might be, uh, to Mark's point, are there folks who have conditions that they would like to discuss? Kurt? Yes. OK. Um, anyone else have conditions they would like to discuss? Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I'm not necessarily a, a complete no vote. Um, but I, but my conditions are significant and it's going to take some time to talk it through uh, around height and parking and those types of things. Um, those aren't, as, as Mark put it, complaints. Um, those are legitimate concerns of mine that I'd want to talk through. And so, um, again, I, I don't know that I have a no vote. I just, I, I just, I don't know that it, it, to, to Mark's point, the other thing is we might not reach there might be a point where there might be an impasse where conditions don't make sense, right? But I, I don't, I don't know that we're there yet, given given the level, the nature and level of our discussions yet. I, I do think it will take some time. Uh, Kurt, you still have your hand up. Did you want to say, add something? Oh no, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, uh, Brad, did you disappear to find a date if we were to vote? To you know. I just look, have been looking at the calendar. So we're on recess on the 27th and the 4th. 
Um, the 18th, we have a full, more than full agenda as we come out of the recess. And then similarly on the 25th, you're talking about occupancy reform and Boulder Junction phase two. So that's a very full meeting as well. My recommendation would be if you wanted to continue it um, that we explore July 11th and schedule a, a special meeting. All right. Um, so it, uh, it sounds to me like there is an interest, there, there's reluctance to continue, but there's also an interest so that we can have a deeper conversation about this when we're not um, uh, muddle-headed. Um, so let me ask, uh, just for a show of thumbs, people who are open to a continuation of this until July 11th. Lisa, are you open to this? July, okay. One, I'm, two, I'm open to it, but I'm also open to continuing now. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, uh, do I have to, do we have to make a motion, Brad, to, for a continuation? I guess we do. Yes, if that's the uh, board's will, you would, you would make a formal motion and second uh, to a date certain, which, you know, uh, Charles has given you a, one option for that and then uh, a vote on that. Okay, so um, is it everyone okay if I just make a motion? So a motion to continue this, uh, to, to continue, I have to remember what the, uh, uh, to continue LUR 2022-00021 uh, for further board discussion until July 11th. A second. Okay. Um, any any further discussion, ML? Um, so we don't generally have a meeting on the second Tuesday of the month. So that is, you know, completely not a target for our board to meet, which is, I'm okay with that. Um, but can we not have a bunch of other stuff piled onto that meeting and just have it be this? period. Don't make it as like, oh, they've got a meeting. Let's do this and that. All right, staff, do you hear Can, that? Charles, we can't hear you. Yep, apologies. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that would be our hope is that we would just keep it uh, um, finishing up on this item. Yeah, okay. so not our hope, but our reality, because I, you know, we're not usually supposed to be meeting on that day anyway, but I would come for this project. Okay, awesome. Okay, so, uh, can I get a second on that motion? Did I, I, get I seconded it. it. Oh, sorry, thank you. Sorry, this is how I can't remember what I'm doing. <laughs> this is why we have to continue. Okay. <laughs> not not just you, Sarah. All of us. <laughs> okay. All right. So the motion on the table is to continue LUR two zero two two dash zero 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 two one until uh, July eleventh. Uh, uh, vote, Laura. Uh, yeah, your name. Yes. Mark. Yes. Lisa? Yes. George? Yes. ML? Yes. Kurt? Yes. Sarah is a yes. All right, seven zero. I thank you all very much. We're gonna lose George and we're gonna lose Lisa. Can, and, the, the, the airport letter, if we yeah, can do we'll that to, quickly. We'll, to matters. we'll do matters, but we will, it's 6.30 in the morning where George is and Lisa has a one and a half year old. So they're going. If folks are able to stay, that would be fantastic. If you have to go, we understand. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you all I'm, very I'm much. staying, and and I, I have one request, and that is that, um, and I, I George, I did not mean to uh, say that just that your thoughts were complaints. I, I am requesting that people use this time between this meeting and the 11th that if you have conditions to craft them, write them down, think them through so that we can we can have something to debate other than I, I don't like this or whatever. So conditions need to be carefully thought. And uh, so come to the meeting prepared is my only request. Great, Mark, I really appreciate that. Um, and it's good a good guidance for us. Okay. We're gonna move on to matters. I wanna thank the public that was here for this. Uh, we'll move on to matters. Uh, the 
Well, the one thing we do know we have is that letter is the letter to city council that Laura drafted. Um, I hope everyone read it and has, if you have comments, we'd like to hear them. Raise your hand if you have comment. Actually, Laura, if you wanna provide some context and then we can ask, see if anyone has questions and if not, it, see if people wanna sign it and send it away. Um, you know, I think the context here is that um, this is an unusual process with the airport. I think it's it's novel for staff. This doesn't come up very often, <laughs> this kind of process. It's novel for us. And um, we have, uh, I've talked this over with Sarah and uh, she and I have very similar perspectives about what might be helpful for the, the process that is not currently planned. And hopefully it would also be a positive thing and a clarifying thing for staff to get some additional direction from city council. So the letter to city council basically does three things. One, it really thanks and appreciates staff for listening to some of our prior input and making sure that that range of scenarios for the future of the airport does include uh, a couple of different levels of consideration of housing. So we wanna thank them for that. And then we have two requests. One is that we get a hearing uh, on this pro uh, project here at planning board, which is not currently planned. Um, and the, the letter talks about why we think that would be a beneficial thing. But I think the main point is that we do view this uh, consideration of the future of the airport to be a land use change issue, even though the process is not looking at land use change right now we're not we don't have a map change on the um, agenda it's a little bit more preliminary but city council will be guiding do we either keep the airport open or do we really move down this pathway of decommissioning and housing and we think it should get a public hearing before it gets to that point so we're asking for a public hearing at planning board on this uh, airport topic that we would have the four scenarios presented to us have a public hearing and be able to provide some input um, and then the second request is this um, this idea of decommissioning the airport and having housing, obviously we've never done that in Boulder before. And there's some information that we think would be very useful to staffs uh, or to council's deliberations that staff uh, do not currently have scoped. Um, you know, the scope is quite narrow. And so we're suggesting that they, they um, add to the scope and that city council, you know, request direct staff to do some uh, pre-work on this idea of an airport to housing transition. What would it take in terms of staff resources, um, you know, scoping the idea of a housing plan, a transportation plan, an infrastructure plan, um, exploring what the benefits could be obtained from doing a decommissioning, and then also what is it going to cost and what's the hassle and what's the um, the process of trying to get a decommissioning with the FAA and kind of exploring that with other communities that have gone through this process. So we're, we're basically suggesting that council direct staff to do some of that research before it comes to council for a decision on do you want to keep the airport or do you want to decommission so ho hopefully that's clear and folks had a chance to read the letter and happy to take questions or suggestions does anyone have questions or suggestions okay. um, I, I don't have questions or suggestions but i'd like to thank you laura for articulating it the way you did i mean i think we often find ourselves in a position of making decisions and we don't have all the data. And you know, you're basically holding um, decision making accountable to, hey, what's it going to cost? What's the process look like? You know, to, let's know what it is people are agreeing, the path that is interested. I really, really appreciate um, bringing that to the table. Thank you. Thank you. I do believe as a facilitator, good decisions are based on good data and figuring out what are the key questions and trying to research that before you ask people to make a decision. I know Brad probably has some things to say. I saw your hand up, Brad. It, yeah, when, when the time's appropriate, I, I certainly don't want to jump ahead of uh, board members discussion, but I do want to provide some feedback uh, from staff at the appropriate time. So. Uh, let me let me know when that is. Well, let's. Does anyone else have comments or questions about the letter? Okay, so then Brad, I think now is the appropriate time. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, you know, we very much appreciate the uh, board's continued stewardship of land use and and engagement on this issue, and understand and appreciate that. Um, I also want to say thank you for giving us an advanced look like the rest of the board at it so that we could digest it and be talked about it a little bit internally. Um, 
we and and I do feel a responsibility to kind of balance some of the administrative implications of this, um, as well as procedural. And uh, this is uh, not meant to dissuade you from sending the letter or um, sending it as is, but just some things that we will need to consider and, and probably share with council if asked. Um, as far as the request um, to have some sort of hearing or meeting before council uh, gets a chance to hear the information and get the information themselves, um, we would be a little bit concerned that that's putting the cart for the horse, that as the policymakers, um, they've given direction, including at the January study session, about the scope and type of feedback they want. And that's what the August 24th work session is designed to do. Um, to have them then at that point, in, in our opinion, refer it at, you know, after that or as part of that meeting to planning board, um, from our perspective, seems more appropriate than having planning board or any board, you know, review uh, a work session item before council did. Uh, just as a maybe technical matter too, it would be more appropriate to have that as a meeting rather than a hearing. Uh, hearings are uh, where the public can give input are either dictated by code when those take place. Um, and as a practical matter, there are as Laura knows and, and others as well, uh, a variety of uh, mechanisms already in place for public input and that type of thing. So having that also at a planning board meeting um, could just confuse what already is a deliberate outreach and, and getting feedback from the public. Um, as far as request number two, um, that type of work plan undertaking is something that is typically decided administratively. So in other words, by the city manager or by uh, senior staff like myself in execution of council direction. Um, that's not to say council may not have an opinion about additional data or such, but that really is something that the city manager by charter is charged with determining workload and work priorities in order to meet council priorities and such. Um, as a practical matter, that, uh, as described in the letter, the draft letter, is really on the order of magnitude of something like our Area 3 infrastructure uh, plan, which has a commitment of thousands of dollars for a consultant and that type of thing, as well as dedicated staff time in this year. So to add something like that, at least at this time frame, um, would, would be a huge undertaking and would necessitate moving other priorities, you know, out of order and really again, city managers or delaying, you know, things into the new year, which of course maybe could come out of this city. You know, that could be a conclusion the city manager makes coming out of the uh, study session in August. So I just wanted to provide that feedback. Uh, you can appreciate that my responsibility is balancing, uh, uh, supporting the board, supporting council, uh, administrating the staff, managing budgets, all that kind of stuff. So I wanted to give that feedback. Brad, can I ask a question in response? Yeah, of course. So those, I, I really appreciate you sharing with us what your what your needs are and your responsibilities are. Um, but if we send this letter, um, which I, I'm, I support us sending the letter, it's an opportunity to open a discussion with council about all those things that you just talked about. Like what, what does council... What is council interested in? Are they interested in what we have recommended? Are they interested in part of it or some of it? Or if they hear from you that this would push back X, Y, Z, they aren't interested. Um, are we in some way, uh, is sending the letter creating a problem or is sending the letter starting a conversation? Well, I, I wouldn't characterize it as creating a problem, right? I'm just trying to uh, provide some context that may make you want to revise part of the letter or not. Um, I think council, you know, gets a lot of input from a lot of different sources and how they would 
follow up on a letter of this nature is, is a little hard for me to predict because it's not through any formal process or channel. They've uh, obviously there's a department charged with running this process, uh, transportation mobility. There's a study session. Um, my best guess is that they would defer this kind of discussion till the study session, but I could be wrong. And of course, um, individuals and members of boards talk to council members about legislative non, you know, items that are not quasi-judicial, like this one is not, uh, regularly. And it of course be your right to contact them individually. We talked about that too. Um, but it's it's hard for me to predict what they would do in this case with the letter in terms of a body and responding to it. Can I just offer a couple of responses? Yeah, of course, please. Um, Sarah, is that okay with you? Yeah, of course. Okay. So, and, and Brad, I completely understand where you're coming from, and I've been part of many processes, and I understand that you get a lot of demands from a lot of different perspectives, and every single one of them can blow up your timeline, blow up your budget. Um, you know, you, you can't do everything that everybody wants you to do. So I completely understand that. Um, in terms of whether planning board is holding a hearing or having a meeting, I do think it's useful to have a venue for public input that is uh, where people can can speak to decision makers and whether that's at planning board or whether that's at city council. I do think that there's a role for that kind of come to the podium and have your three minutes that is missing from this process as far as uh, as it's been explained to me so far. Um, and if if council thinks it's more appropriate to have that kind of input at their meeting, I think that's fine. If they would want to have something at planning board after they meet in August rather than before, I think it's kind of up to them to sequence it. But I, I do think that it is our recommendation that similar to many other land use planning processes like Boulder Junction or um, you know uh, the Diagonal Plaza or CU South, that at least I think CU South, I wasn't part of that process, but planning board usually takes a look at it. And then we add our thoughts and recommendations to the packet of materials that council gets to review. So if we're trying to be out of sequence here and council thinks that it's more appropriate to have that input later, I, I think that's fine. But I agree with Sarah that we want to at least raise this to them that there is currently no public hearing scheduled and, and give our recommendation. Um, for the second recommendation, I, uh, I hope it doesn't look like it's a bigger lift than it's intended to be, right? Like, so for that first bullet point about estimating costs, resources, and level of effort to negotiate with the FAA, that could be as simple as a few phone calls to managers at other airports who have done this. Like, did you have to go through litigation? How long did it take? What were the, who did you use as an attorney? What was your result? What did it cost? That kind of research can be done in a couple of days. The scoping of staff level or consultant studies you know, we're not certainly suggesting that you should do a housing plan than an infrastructure study and a transportation plan, but at least have a general sense of the scope of those efforts. And I don't, I don't know how long it generally takes to scope something like that, but hopefully it wouldn't be too big of a lift. And then the third bullet point, estimating market value of the land and revenue gains to the city, that could be something as simple as using something like Holiday as a reference point and saying, if it were built to this level, um, in this kind of pattern, here's about how much we would expect the land values to be, and here's about how much we would expect in property taxes and sales taxes. If it were at a similar density with a similar similar level of, you know, neighborhood serving business versus residents, hopefully those things don't don't you know it doesn't have to be like defensible in court. It can be kind of back at the envelope, but right now we have none of that that is publicly available information, and it would be good for council to have access to some of that before they're asked to make a decision. So that's kind of the intention there. It's not meant to be uh, a work plan level of detail. It's just meant to be, let's let's do something to give people some sense. Because right now there's no sense of how many units could this be? Like people are throwing around numbers. It would be good to have staff um, give us some, uh, you know, some research or, or some justifiable numbers rather than it becoming a political issue or a he said, she said. Well, that's, so that, that's the thinking there. I, I appreciate you, you know, parsing that difference. Um, okay, so I think what we, for the five of us who are still here, um, is there general agreement that we would like to send this letter as is? Thumbs up, thumbs up, Kurt, thumbs up. Yeah. Did you have some concerns or was? 
Kurt, do you oh, me, Kurt? Kurt? Uh, no, I mean, I think that there are some things that could maybe be further explained, especially based on the context that Brad gave. But uh, I think we could also send it as it is and explain those things in due time. Okay. All right, I'm a thumbs up also. So I believe we need to make a motion. Um, uh, is that correct, Brad? We need to make a motion. Yeah, if you're taking action, uh, you can just reference the letter that had been circulated. Though you don't have to, you don't have to yeah. read. <laughs> All right, Laura, would you like to make your own motion? Sure. I move that uh, planning board approve sending the letter that is in the packet. Wednesday, June 21st, planning board no, no, meeting no, no. packet. No, 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 Tuesday, June 20th. I'm sorry, Tuesday, June, sorry, I'm looking at my. <laughs> Laura, yes, I, yeah, Tuesday, yeah, yeah. June 20th, so. <laughs> looking at my computer, Tuesday, June, okay, I'm going to start over. Okay. I move that planning board send the letter that is in our packet for Tuesday, June 20th uh, to city council regarding the airport planning process. Do we have a second? Second. ML, ML seconded it. Okay. Uh, both voice vote. Kurt. Yes. Uh, ML. Yes. Mark. Yes. Laura. Yes. Sarah is a yes. Okay. So do so it's passed. Um, and here's a question: How does the letter get conveyed? Is, will that be sent by planning staff to council? Do we send? Will Laura email it? How do we send it? So in the past, I have used the uh, the city's portal for commenting to city council that automatically goes to city council and city manager and appropriate staff. And I just I can just give it a brief preface saying, dear city council and city manager um, Riviera Vandermeide, um, please see the letter below, which was approved on this date by planning board with a 5-0 vote. Perfect. All members present. Okay. And I can say uh, members Smith and Boone absent. Okay, that's great. All right, um, I'm not trying to speed us along too much, but I am trying to speed us along. Are there? Thank you very much, Laura. Um, are there other matters that staff that uh, board members want to bring up? I see shit nod, no no nods, all shaking heads. Okay, Brad, is there anything you want to bring up? Just two quick things. One, I appreciate uh, your ongoing recognition of the hard work of staff and bringing cases forward and uh, working through problems and such. Uh, they are, I, I can say this because they're not here, right? I can brag on them and they're a hardworking group and, and uh, it's always uh, nice to have you acknowledge that at, at various times. So thank you for doing that uh, periodically and ongoing. And then the other thing I was gonna mention is uh, thank you for the, uh, what I would kind of characterize as introductory conversation around code changes that um, are are potentially upcoming within the next nine months or so designed to re-examine some of the uh, institutionalized processes that might be stringing out process, you know, for applicants more than is practical uh, given other checks and balances that have developed over the years. It's, uh, you know, it's grown over the years and I think there's a recognition by council and we look forward to following through on their uh, direction to us on that and bringing that forward to you all. All right, thank That's you, it. Brad. Thank you. And um, I, I'm certainly not one who says thank you enough. So I will I will echo what you <laughs> said. Thank you to staff. Um, you all do a great job and you, you, you stay late nights nearly every night of the week. So thank you. Um, can can I give a special thanks to Sloan for picking up that extremely complicated Millennium Project, dealing with all of our extremely detailed and complicated questions with such grace, especially given the technical challenges. And I thought that the packet, that there was a good detail level of staff justification and analysis for everything. And I really appreciated how she handled that. So um, hopefully she'll be able to watch this uh, in retrospect, but Brad, if you could please pass along our appreciations tonight, especially to Sloan. Will do. I think you mean Shannon, but yes. I'm sorry, Shannon. <laughs> did I say Sloan? Oh my God, it's too late at night. Shannon, you're right. You're right. But I will do that. Thank you. All right. Uh, Amanda, do you have anything you need to tell us? No, just, right. a, just a calendar check. We'll see you guys July 11th and send out some information or the agenda, which is just the continuance of this. Great. Thank you. And Laurel, anything you need 
to tell us? No, not at the moment. Thank you all very much, Madam Chair. Okay. All right. I'm adjourning this meeting. Everyone go get some sleep. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.